There we go. We are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our virtual fireside. Look who we've got. We've got Gainal and Condi. We've got Dr. David Morgan and this bald guy. And I am so <laughs> excited that we get to be with you guys. Thank you so much. Holy cow. We're just, the numbers are just coming in. We already have 3.9 million people watching. This is incredible. <laughs> this is really good. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. You are in for a treat tonight. Let me tell you, you know, this is going to be, I think, you know, these firesides, if you've been joining us for these firesides over the last couple of weeks, you already know that you are in for an unbelievable treat. And there has been so much good that has been done and so many incredible stories that have been shared. But I'm telling you tonight, um, this one, I think, is going to be one for the record books um, to hear from two experts in terms of what how do we hang on to hope? How do we hold on when it seems like it's impossible to do so? And uh, man, I have heard Gana Lynn talk about that topic multiple times. And uh, I don't know if there's anyone better except for potentially a doctor. Okay. <laughs> You've got Dr. David Morgan. First of all, Gana Lynn, Brother Morgan, how are you guys doing? Wonderful. Good. I'm, I'm doing wonderful. I, I'm excited to be here. I went on my Instagram account earlier and I, I, value being authentic and honest as much as social media will allow that to be. And so I didn't want anyone to be confused that, you know, I have it all together because full disclosure, I do not. <laughs> and um, earrings and lipstick, lipstick can do a lot to, to make it look like I have it together. But I've been pretty physically sick, but battling some of my own mental health stuff the last few weeks, like many in the world. And so I'm really grateful that Onward has a virtual platform because this would probably, I've never canceled a speaking event. I've done about 1200 events in the last four or five years and I've never canceled one, but today I, it would have probably not been very safe to be in person. So I'm really honored to be with, with you, Kevin, and with you, Dr. Morgan tonight. And especially that we're talking about this because as I shared on my Instagram, live a few minutes ago for me as a teacher that's really what i see speaking and writing as that god has me teach from the place i'm learning and so i'm right there with with the whole world i think we're all being stretched all of my friends that are therapists that have important names and titles by their names have been struggling as well and so i think it's so worthwhile that we have this conversation tonight Awesome. Oh, that's so great. My light just went off in my office. If I, in my office, if it's, I've got a motion activated light and if I, if I sit still for longer than 90 seconds, it goes off. I don't know. And so that's why I dance so often I was just to, keep, say, hopefully you'll be <laughs> to keep the lights on. Well, we are so glad now, everybody, we've got a lot of people jumping on. Thank you so much for joining us. If you can, I want you to go to the chat. And I want you to tell us where you're, where you are joining us from. Um, we're live on Facebook. We're live on YouTube. Uh, there's a very good chance CNN is broadcasting this because could there be anything better? No. Um, and so uh, we are really happy to have you guys here. But shout us out. Let us know where you're from. I'm here in the exotic metropolis known as Orem, Utah. Um, it's exotic for sure. Uh, and now. Brother Morgan, where are you located besides I'm your in home? Vancouver, Washington. So Vancouver. this is another blessing of uh, COVID-19. My wife and I, we we go on these long walks and we talk because I'm with you, again, Lynn. I'm I'm over this. I'm done. You know, this is this has been super hard. But we keep talking about what can we find, what are the blessings that are coming from this? Because surely there are. You have to look for them. They don't really grab you in the face. But um that's one of them is being able to do something like this, you know, from my den, you know, thousands of miles away from you guys and, and thousands and thousands of miles away from everyone who's listening. So really grateful Donward um, Productions for putting it on. And I think it'll be a good evening. Yes. Thank you so much. And, and uh, Gendalyn, you're not far from me, right? I'm in Lehigh, Utah. Yes. Lehigh. Another so, exotic. Metropolis. Very Hey, yeah. listen, we have a Cabela's. That makes us exotic. Hey, there you go. <laughs> a little, bit, can say a little bit of fudge and some fish that, you know, and some guns. That makes you exotic. Yeah. 
you're good. And yeah. a Buffalo burger upstairs. <laughs> exactly. Okay? And then you're yeah. good to go. <laughs> well, awesome. Well, we are going to get things going. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, as I mentioned, thank you for jumping on and telling us where you're from. We've got Ogden. We've got San Jose. Uh, we've got, oh, let's see, we've got Idaho. Um, so Brazil. Thank, we, what, from where? Brazil. 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 Wow. Look at that. Brazil, Irvine, Mesa. Um, we've got a bunch of people from Utah. We've got Georgia. Hello, Rebecca. We've got, this is awesome. I mean, how cool is this? So thank you so much, everybody, for jumping on and telling us where you're from. Continue to do that. And uh, we feel so blessed to be with you tonight. I'm going to go ahead and start things with an opening prayer. And then we're going to get to uh, the individuals who you came to hear, which it ain't me. Um, we're I'm going to let you we're going to let you hear from two absolutely incredible individuals. And I'm so excited for you to hear from them so that we can talk about how do we hold on to hope when sometimes it feels a little tough just to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and lead us off with an opening prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this evening and we're so thankful for the opportunity to gather virtually. We're so thankful for the blessing of technology that allows us to do just that. We're so thankful that we could be gathered together in this way. And we pray that we may have thy spirit to be with us or that we know when two or three are gathered in thy name that we can feel the spirit of the Lord. Father, we pray for the Holy Ghost to be with us. We pray that we can think of the Savior tonight, that we can think of his infinite atonement. We are thankful for this plan of happiness. And we are thankful that joy can be found. We pray for a special blessing to be with Gaina Lynn, that her health will allow her to deliver that message which thou hast given unto her. And we pray for Brother Morgan, that thou wilt bless him with the same. We pray for all those in attendance that they may listen with open hearts, open ears, and with a desire to take something into their lives that will make a true difference. And it's for these things we pray, and with gratitude in our hearts that we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, so here's my little tip. Whenever I host a meeting like this, my tip is this. You are going to hear an unbelievable amount of information tonight. All excellent, great, beautiful, wonderful things. But I guarantee you, there is gonna be at least one main big thing. It may come from Brother Morgan, it may come from Gaina Lynn, it may be one from each. But I guarantee that your heart, if you will be open, will take, even if it's just one thing tonight, look for that one and take it into your life and apply it immediately and watch the miracles begin to take place. So with that, let me introduce Brother Morgan. Now, I am so excited to hear from Dr. David Morgan. Um, he's a graduate of BYU and uh, he has a doctorate in counseling psychology. Um, he's worked as a psychologist in private practice for almost 20 years, which uh, is my entire life because I'm only 20. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but almost 30 years ago, he married his best friend. They have six children together, which tells me they are busy and tired. Um, and, uh, and they have two daughters-in-law and three grandchildren. Uh, Dr. Morgan, he's, he's authored several books on the gospel and mental health topics. Uh, he's convinced, as am I, and I think Gaynell Lynn would add her voice to this as well, that the gospel of Jesus Christ holds multiple keys to resolving mental health issues. Um, he's currently serving as an elders quorum president, but his favorite calling was a seminary teacher. And you're in Washington, Brother Morgan. So did you get to do early morning seminary? Absolutely. Yeah. See, that's the way to do it. Years. That's the way to do it. I yeah. I'm from California originally. So I got to go to early morning seminary. And it was, I will say, I think I learned a lot of the gospel through, uh, you know, just um, subliminally since I slept through most of early morning seminary. But nonetheless, I know... <laughs> I learned, no, really, early morning seminary was awesome. Early morning seminary teachers have a special place in my heart because they've changed my life. And so um, that's good to hear that that was your favorite calling. This is another thing uh, you and I have in common, Dr. Morgan. Um, your your favorite hobby is going to Disneyland. You've been there over 100 times. I don't know if I've been 100, but I wish I had been. It is quite <laughs> literally something I think about 
almost daily, which my wife will tell you, uh, she's pretty sure I'm nuts for doing that. Um, but I love Disneyland and I love that you're here tonight to talk to us. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn over the stage or the screen or the video camera or the, the broadcast or the, the virtual fireside to brother, Dr. David Morgan, over to you. Thank you very, very much. I, I'm super grateful to be here, really grateful to Onward um, Productions for inviting me and having me and, and making the technology available because um, we can see this, so many people seeing this everywhere. It's gonna be awesome. I am going to try to share my screen now. So hold on just a second. I might need some help from the back end here. Okay, I can see my screen. Shane, are you on? Can you uh, do anything about that? Okay. <laughs> Maybe we won't see my screen. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay, so the, the title tonight is Finding Strength and Comfort, Managing Mental Health Issues Using Gospel Principles. Um, let me introduce you to my family real quick. Uh, that's my, there's me in the middle. Um, there is Kristen. And uh, she, like I said, we've been married almost 30 years. We have uh, Jordan in the plaid shirt with his wife, Contessa. Uh, we'll get to the grandkids in just a minute. Um, to the other side of Kristen is Carter and Lydia. Uh, back on the other side in the light blue is McKay. Next to him is Davis. Flip back to the other side in the pink tie is Parker and Kennedy, who is the last, uh, the youngest, the baby girl. And uh, yes, I do spoil her, as many people ask. Um, we didn't know if we were having another girl or another boy. We knew that she was our last child. We just felt like that was it. And uh, I was super surprised when she was born, but she's been a delight, as have all the our children. Um, let me show you our grandkids here. So these are the three right here. This is where I would pause for oohs and ahs. But we'll start here by introducing David. Uh, David is almost three years old. Um, and that look on his face is exactly the way he is. He's precocious um, and, a, uh, and a great little guy. This is Rigby who it will be one in just a few days. They're actually with us uh, right now for a little bit. Um, and uh, she is, she's cute. She is uh, a bit of a chunk, you can see, and absolutely delightful. And rounding out is Teddy, who is about three months old now. He's the younger brother of David. Um, and so, and I'm telling you, being grandparents is absolutely awesome. I highly recommend it to you. Uh, talking a little bit about Disneyland, uh, there's my favorite person and my favorite Disneyland attraction. People often ask me, what's your favorite ride at Disneyland? You're looking at it in the background. That's the Mark Twain Riverboat. I love just getting on that thing and sitting down and riding it around the rivers of America. I've got close seconds in, uh, in a bunch of different attractions, but I really enjoy that one. Um, just a, a little side note. So our son, Carter, he works for the Walt Disney Corporation in Orlando, Florida as a software engineer. And my brother, Ben, is an Imagineer. Maybe they're listening. If so, hey, Ben. Hey, Kier. Uh, they uh, Ben's an Imagineer in Anaheim at Disneyland, California. And if you have been on the new ride, Rise of the Resistance, which is the marquee attraction at Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, uh, if you've been on it and you survived and did not die, that is thanks to Ben. He's a mechanical engineer and he has, uh, and so that's his job to kind of make sure that ride was absolutely safe. Um, we got to ride it with him just before Disneyland closed in March, which was super fun. But yeah, I'm with you, Shane. Disneyland's awesome. A very expensive hobby, unfortunately, but my hobby nonetheless. Okay, let's first let's talk about just some general themes um, regarding the gospel and mental health. Here is a, a shot of Winnie the Pooh to keep with the Disney theme. Uh, you might remember the story when uh, Pooh runs out of honey and so goes over to Rabbit's house to have some of Rabbit's honey. 
And uh, I guess rabbits don't eat much honey because rabbit had a very large supply. And so he uh, Pooh ate all of rabbit's honey. As Pooh tried to leave, he got stuck in rabbit's door. And he ended up staying there for quite some time until he thinned out enough to where his friends could pull him out of it. And there's a line in there that I absolutely love um, as rabbit is trying to push Pooh out of the hole and Winnie the Pooh is stuck um, in the other side. And they're both complaining about whose fault it is. And um, Rabbit says, it all comes from eating too much honey. And Pooh says, it all comes from having front doors not big enough. And I love that because uh, it really, I mean, it was Winnie the Pooh's fault. He ate too much honey. The size of the door had nothing to do with his choices, yet he blamed the size of the door on the fact that he couldn't get out instead of his own behaviors. So when we talk about mental health issues, one of the first things we need to realize is we have to take personal accountability. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware that a lot of the stuff that happens to us is not our fault, um, and, uh, and, and that's true. However, we need to take responsibility for those things that we can control in our lives. And if we're blaming all of our situations on front doors not being big enough, then uh, we're going to miss out on a lot of things. Um, the circumstances that we have in our own lives, regardless of how they started, are ours. And we have to own them and we have to figure out how to move forward. So we need to learn to take responsibility for ourselves. Uh, let me show you another, oops, didn't mean to do that. Okay, Law of the Harvest. This is from Galatians chapter six, verse seven. Um, and it, uh, the scripture reads, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Um, this life, you are going to get out of this life what you put into it every single time. And there, there really is probably no more immutable law than the law of the harvest. Uh, we have to, we, if you want something good out of life, you have to put something good into life. Um, and hard work is part of the plan. We'll talk about that a little bit later. You can't put in a little amount of work and expect to get a large amount of benefit. It's contrary to the principles of the gospel. So whatever you're willing to put into it is what you're likely to get out of it. So it's just something else to remember when we talk about mental health issues. Um, if you want a large benefit, if you want big scale changes in your life, then you got to engage in big scale behaviors. Uh, large scale changes come from large scale, or I'm sorry, small scale changes come from small scale behaviors. Um, when we talk about kind of spiritual, like spirituality and mental health or like gospel remedies for mental health, I get, um, I get this idea often. This was something someone told to me, uh, told me a while ago. They said, please don't make this a presentation where we hear, just pray and read your scriptures. That doesn't help someone truly suffering from mental health issues. Please recognize and honor the need to take advantage of counseling and medications. I totally agree. Um, you can't just pray away your mental health issues. But I think we also need to acknowledge that um, when we have emotional issues that we're struggling with, we're being attacked on multiple fronts. We're being attacked on a cognitive or a thinking front. We're being attacked on a biological front sometimes, uh, like a neurological front, and we're being attacked on a spiritual front. And so if you're being attacked on four fronts, why are you only fighting the battle on one or two? Um, you're going to get beat if you only fight that battle on one front, if it's a forefront battle. And so this idea of using the gospel to bless our lives when it comes to um, our mental health issues is really critical because we don't, um, because there are spiritual aspects to it that will get better. And that doesn't mean you stop fighting on the other fronts either, but you have to fight on all of them. Um, okay. Here is my website. Uh, if you have any questions for me, there's a place where you can submit a question. Uh, you can also find out a little more about me. So I'll show that again at the end, but it's www.ldspsychologist.com. Okay, let's talk about how to identify mental health issues first. This is kind of the first of four themes that we'll talk about tonight. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about kind of how psychological diagnosis works. Um, there's a, there's a book that's in its fifth iteration right now. It's called The Diagnostic 
and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, fifth edition. And it's just a giant list of everything that can go wrong with you emotionally or mentally. Um, and we have those uh, professionals like myself. I'm a psychologist, licensed psychologist. I have that book on my shelf and memorized about half of it. Um, they're created for our convenience, for the convenience of professionals, so that we can take um, large sets um, of symptoms and describe them in just a few words. So instead of, if someone's referring someone to me and they say, well, Dr. Morgan, I've got this person I want you to see, well, fantastic, well, what's, uh, what's going on with her? And, and he says, well, she is, um, she feels sad most of the time. She lacks a lot of motivation. Um, she gets periodically agitated. Her sleeping is really crummy. Um, she has feelings of worthlessness and guilt, some feelings of hopelessness as well. Sometimes she even thinks about wanting to end her life. Um, instead of him having to tell me all those things, he can say she has major depressive disorder. And once he says that, then I know what those what that is. So these are just ways to kind of compartmentalize um, that long list of diagnoses so that we can uh, communicate effectively with one another. This next point is really, really important. In most all cases, diagnoses are temporary and not permanent. Um, I deal with a lot of people um, over the last 10 years, I've been doing a lot of evaluations for the state and I've evaluated over 6,000 people in the last 10 years. And uh, a lot of times they'll come into me and tell me about all the, the diagnoses they'll have and they'll rattle off 10 different mental health diagnoses. And sometimes I say, man, how did you even walk in here with all those diagnoses? That, that was a lot of stuff to be wrong with you. Um, and they'll say, well, I got this one back in 85. And then this doctor diagnosed me with this one in 92. And then in this one in 97. And so they have just this list, um, this running list of psychological diagnoses that they've been collecting. Um, and, but in most cases, they're not active. Uh, these, these, the symptoms that they're going through are not active at the time. So these diagnoses do not apply. So in almost all cases, like I said, the diagnosis is kind of a temporary condition. This is something that you're going through. It could last for a while, um, but it's something you're going through that is probably going to be fixed at some point. And uh, true confession, I don't like diagnostic labels, um, especially since Google. Uh, if, I were, if we were in a fireside where you were all in person, I would ask you, who among you has Googled your mental health symptoms? And about half the people would kind of sheepishly raise their hand like this, and the other half would uh, be being dishonest when they kept their hands in their laps because uh, we get interested in that and we think, okay, what's wrong with me? When I was in uh, uh, graduate, no, this was in my undergraduate in psychology, I took a class called Abnormal Psychology where basically you just learn about all the different diagnoses, everything that could go wrong with you. And I'd come home every day and say, yep, got that, got that. I mean, I'd look through every list and think, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. And so there's a lot of self-diagnosis going around. Can I just ask you, please stop doing that? Don't diagnose yourself. Let us diagnose you. Let a competent mental health professional give you a diagnosis. Uh, diagnoses are, um, they're subtle. There's a lot of issues that apply beyond just the list of symptoms. Um, they can vary from time to time. They can reappear. They can disappear. So there's all bunch of, a lot of subtlety involved in that. So um, all you armchair diagnosticians out there, just going to ask you, please stop. And here, let me give you, here's a great example. What do we call this? So this is a list of symptoms um, that we, that you might see. Uh, history of extreme trauma, nightmares, flashbacks, avoidance of associated memories, Negative self-beliefs, chronic negative emotions, limited interest in things, feeling detached from others, irritability, easily startled, poor concentration, and poor sleep. So what is that? Some of you might have a guess as to what that is. Let me give you some, some, some ideas. Is this condition called soldier's heart, da Costa's syndrome, shell shock, war neurosis, combat fatigue, gross stress reaction, adjustment reaction to adult life, or post-traumatic stress disorder? Well, if you answered all of the above, you are right. Depending on the year, this, this set of symptoms had a different name. Um, and some of those things like soldier's heart, that goes back to uh, the early 1900s when they saw um, veterans coming back from war and experiencing these symptoms. 
It's now called post-traumatic stress disorder. But you can see why I don't really care for the diagnostic label because what we call post-traumatic stress disorder today, we might call it something different five years later. So that label doesn't necessarily mean anything to me. Um, when, when people come in and they say, I've got PTSD or I've got major depression or I've got generalized anxiety disorder, what I ask them is, I, I, don't, really, I don't really care what the label is. What's going on with you? What are you feeling? What are, you, what are your symptoms? What is getting in the way of you being able to live your life on a day-to-day -day basis? We can call that whatever we want. I don't care. That's what we got to fix. And so here's kind of the rule of thumb. It's very, very simple for me. If it looks broken, it probably is. If it's getting in your way of being able to do things, then it needs you need some help one way or another. Um, one of the other things that, that that big book that lists everything that can go wrong with you it says that uh, even if you just have the symptoms, it has to cause some sort of clinically significant impairment in your day-to-day -day functioning. So you could have all the symptoms of major depressive disorder, still be functioning well from day to day, and you wouldn't qualify for the diagnosis. So diagnosis, again, it's a subtle art um, and really should be left to, uh, to those of us who know. Okay, I get this question a lot. Does mental illness run in families? And the answer is probably, it's a nice safe answer, but not for why you might think um, it happens. And this is my personal belief. Um, it's my professional belief as well. So it's backed up by a lot of education and experience, but I think most all of mental illness is a combination of what we call nature and nurture. So that's our biological predispositions, those things that we come with naturally and then our ongoing environment, um, how you know you come with a, a certain set of biological issues, but um, after 18, 36, 50 years, that there's gonna be an influence on those things depending on the environments that you're in. Personally, I believe that nurture, so the effect of the environment around us has a more profound effect than nature. So if you were born with some sort of uh, biological predisposition towards depression or anxiety or something like that, I think depending on the environment that you're in, that that can be exacerbated or that can be um, limited or decreased over time. And, and here's just an example. Uh, what I say, if your parents had anxiety issues and you do as well, then are you anxious become, because of some sort of unique genetic marker or the fact that you spent 18 extremely formative years watching the two most influential people in your life experience ongoing anxiety? Um, I think, and we'll talk a little bit later about uh, the weakness associated with the human condition. And I do believe that, um, that we're here to learn and part of that is to have weakness and to struggle. Um, but not everything that is going on with us is just because, you know, that's the way we've always been. My dad was anxious. My grandpa was anxious. My great grandpa was anxious. And so I'm anxious as well. I don't know that that's um, not overcomable. In fact, I believe just about everything is overcomable. And that's kind of the idea of hope. I think that Gina Lynn's going to talk about a little bit later. Um, let's read some scriptures here. Second Nephi 2.26. And the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. And because that they are redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever, knowing good from evil, to act for themselves and not to be acted upon, save by the punishment of the law at the great and last day, according to the commandments which God hath given. This is what I don't like about this kind of idea that um, I, I'm just always this way. I was born this way. Uh, you know, it's, it's a genetic condition, it's, it's particularly regarding mental health issues, because like that sentence that's highlighted there, we are here to act for ourselves and not to be acted upon. Um, and when people say, I just can't help it, it's just the way I am, I think that runs contrary to what Nephi is saying here. I'm sorry, this is Lehi, actually. What Lehi is saying here um, is that we are here to act and not to be acted upon. Um, so that taking responsibility for our behaviors, instead of saying there's nothing I can do about this and just laying down and letting it uh, wash over me, we act for ourselves. We become agents. Um, there are some cases where limits are set, and, and I'm not naive enough to, to not look at that. And there's some very, very severe forms of mental illness 
that only seem to respond to medication. You can talk about um, physical disabilities and things like that. Um, and, uh, and some of those, there may be some limits on the things you can do. I'm never going to be a, a professional volleyball player. I played a little bit of volleyball in, uh, in um, college, just intramural and things like that. But I am, uh, I'm not going to be there. It's just not me. Um, but uh, I could be okay. I could be decent. But there are there are some limits. But when it comes to mental health issues, I think most of them are we can overcome them. I really think we can. Uh, Elder Christofferson, I love this quote. God intends that his children should act according to the moral agency he has given them. It is his plan and his will that we have the principal decision making role in our own in our own life's drama. We're the ones making the decisions, not something else, not our biology, not what someone else did to us, but that we, it is Heavenly Father's plan and his will that we are the principal decision makers in our lives. Okay, let's move on to the second theme here, uh, the role of therapy and medication in responding to mental health issues. Like my friend said earlier, don't just make this all about prayer and scripture study. And I am not because there are uh, medication and therapy is important. But I think we, we need to talk about the, the respective power of each. Um, when it comes to psychiatric medications, sometimes medication is absolutely necessary. And this is when the thought process has been taken over by something else. Um, and you see, talk about cases like schizophrenia, where you have um, these people have significant delusions and hallucinations and things like that. They can't think their way out of that. Um, they need medication to help with that. Um, bipolar disorder, where you have true manic episodes. Uh, I mean, these are these are legitimate situations where these people, their brain is just doing something different. Um, and medication is essential to help correct that. In most cases of mental illness, thoughts are the most powerful agents of change. Um, it is, um, that that's that's really what I think is that we have to change the way we think in order to change the way we feel. It's very, very simple, but very, very difficult. And so when you talk about these psychiatric medications, I like to refer to them more like staircases and then like escalators. So if you're in a pit that's very difficult um, to, uh, to get out of, what a medication does is it lowers a staircase into that pit, but you still have to climb the staircase. If you sit on that bottom step and, and wait, then nothing's going to happen. There's nothing that pulls you out of that pit um, like an escalator would. And people say, what do you mean there's no escalator? Um, this is why there's no escalator. Abraham chapter three, verse 24. And there stood one among them that was like unto God. And he said unto those who were with him, we will go down for there is space there. And we will take of these materials and we'll make an earth whereon these may dwell. And we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. If there's an escalator, if someone pulls you out of the pit, then that's not us doing all things what the Lord God commands us. He says, I'm going to help you out because there's some pits that are too deep of to get out of um, purely on your own. But, but you need to do your part as well. And that's part of that test. That's part of life. Why we're here is to show that we'll do those things. Um, and it's just, uh, it's hard and it's supposed to be hard. So when do you ask for help? When is the pit too deep that you can't get out of it yourself? Um, soon as possible. If you find yourself in a situation that is lasting, that you've been in the same situation, kind of stuck for years and years, and you think, ah, I wonder if I need some help. Yeah, you probably do. What is what is help? I mean, it could be anything. Maybe you need a self-help book. Maybe you need to talk to a friend. Maybe you need to talk to a professional. Maybe you need medication. All kinds of things that you can do. But if we just try to do it all by ourselves, it's typically very ineffective. Um, I had a, uh, a friend who was um, basically trying everything except changing your own thoughts. Um, and so she's kind of the opposite of this. It says here that if we try to do things entirely on our own, that um, we don't learn to be humble. And I think God gives us weakness so that we can be humble. In fact, I just quoted half of uh, Ether 1227, and we'll talk about that later. Hiding our flaws does not help. Um, trying to pretend like everything's fine, I've got no problems. 
it doesn't help. Um, I wish we could just have a big giant meeting, every member of the church, because um, there's a there's a culture in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints where we like to put on our best front and we like to look like uh, everything's going just fine, where many times it's not. Um, so it doesn't help to to hide from those things. The true resolution to all of our mortal flaws, including mental health challenges, is repentance. And you say, come on, Brother Morgan, what are you talking about? I can't repent my way out of depression. I can't repent my way out of anxiety. Now, hold on. Let me, let me show you something that might change your mind. President Nelson, thus, when Jesus asks you and me to repent, he is inviting us to change our mind, our knowledge, our spirit, even the way we breathe. He's asking us to change the way we love, think, serve, spend our time, treat our wives, treat our children, and even care for our bodies. When we choose to repent, we choose to change. We allow the Savior to transform us into the best version of ourselves. We choose to grow spiritually and receive joy, the joy of redemption in him. When we choose to repent, we choose to become more like Jesus Christ. I love that. Um, that is, uh, that's absolutely true. So this idea of repentance goes far beyond just uh, repenting of sin. Like I did a bad thing today and I need to repent, or I, I forgot to read my scripture, so I need to repent. Repentance is the change vehicle for our entire lives. So if I'm uh, sad all the time and I need to be happier, I repent in order to be happier. That's that change process. Or if I learn to have more faith, going from fear to more faith, that's the repentance process as well. It's all repentance. Okay, and one more thing in this uh, section here. Quote from David O. McKay, when the Lord tells you what to do, you've got to have the courage to do it or you'd better not ask him again. I love that quote. Um, oftentimes we will ask for help and ask the Lord to help us and he gives us chances and we don't take them. Um, so like praying for assistance usually results in opportunities to change and opportunities to act. The Lord's not going to do it for you. but He's going to give you a chance to do something about it. So if you're you have a lot of anxiety and you're saying, Heavenly Father, help me be less anxious. And then the executive secretary calls and you you know that number and you don't take that call because you say, oh, no, no, I'm not going to talk to him because he's going to ask me to give a talk or ask me to say a prayer or something like that. Then what was the point of your prayer? What was the point of your pleading to Heavenly Father saying, Heavenly Father, bless me that I won't be less anxious. And he says, oh, OK, here's a chance for you to pray in public. That will help you be less anxious because you'll do something you're afraid of and you'll realize it wasn't as bad as you thought. So you have to take those chances. Don't ignore them when they come. Okay, knowing that not everyone tonight who's listening may be struggling with mental health issues, but many who are listening might be um, working with people. Maybe it's a spouse or a child or a, a parent or another loved one who suffers with mental health issues. So just a couple of ideas for you regarding that. Um, and first of all, to the helpers out there, the bottom line is there's nothing you can do uh, to cause change in another person. You just, just, you just can't do it. Um, uh, they have to choose to change. Uh, if you try to force change in someone, that is just like what Lucifer wanted to do in the pre-existence, to force us all to come back to Father in Heaven. And while that would have been lovely in terms of us all getting back to him, it would have completely defeated the purpose of mortality. We're here to grow and to learn to become like him through making difficult choices. And if you force those choices in someone else, there's no point. Um, that's that point right there. For even forcing positive change is contrary to Heavenly Father's plan. Uh, Elder Rendland recently said in conference, Heavenly Father doesn't want us to do what's right. He wants us to choose to do what is right. And that is so critical. Um, we are agents unto ourselves, and those we work with need, and, and love need to be agents unto themselves as well. Um, but we still have to act. You can't take away from this, hey, Brother Morgan said, I don't have to do anything. It's all your responsibility, so see you later. It doesn't work that way either. Um, here's uh, something from Mormon late in his life. Behold, I'm laboring with them. This is the apostate Nephites who are almost extinct. And when I speak the word of God with sharpness, they tremble in anger against me. And when I use no sharpness, they harden their hearts against it. Wherefore, I fear lest the spirit of the Lord hath ceased striving with them. And now, my beloved son, notwithstanding, notwithstanding their hardness, let us labor diligently. For if we should cease to labor, we should be brought under condemnation. For we have a labor to perform whilst in this tabernacle of clay, 
that we may conquer the enemy of all righteousness and rest our souls in the kingdom of God. We still have to do something, even regardless of the outcome. If the people we're trying to help never get better, we still need to help. We need to do what's appropriate and help them. So a couple of things that you might be able to do and not do. Number one is please be patient. That uh, graphic there is uh, of the prodigal son. Um, and and what we what we think we know about that is his dad didn't go chasing after him. He waited. Um, and it probably broke his heart every night. I can picture him sitting there on the front porch, looking at the horizon, hoping to see his son and night after night being disappointed because his son was out uh, recklessly spending his inheritance. But when the son came to himself, as the scripture says, and he said, then I'll go home. And he did. And the reunion was wonderful. Um, I, I'm, I'm of the belief that we're going to be able to, uh, in heaven, there's going to be this big giant um, uh, screen where we can see all these awesome events from history. And this is one of the ones I want to see. I want to see um, the that night when the prodigal son came home and his uh, dad running to meet him. Um, so people have to make their own decisions, be patient with them, wait on them. Even if that means pain on your part, um, that's important. Judging righteously. You, that's a funny picture there. You might recognize that from a, a, one of the messages the church produced where this woman would look out her window at uh, her neighbor's dirty laundry as she was hanging her wash. And she would say, that woman, someone needs to teach that woman how to do a wash because the, the clothes were dingy. The whites were kind of grayish. And so, and every morning she would look out and see this neighbor's dingy wash and, and be kind of critical of her thinking, Ugh, you know, who taught that woman how to do a wash? And then one morning she uh, looks out there and she says, huh, someone must have finally taught her because the, the clothes were white and they looked much better. And her husband says, well, honey, you'd be interested to know that this morning I got up and washed our windows. So the whole time what she thought was dingy clothing was actually her own dirty windows that she was looking through. Um, first ne third Nephi 14, five, and this is in Matthew as well. Um, the Savior said, this Sermon on the Mount, thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. So we need to make sure that we are executing a righteous judgment on others. And we say, um, so when we're laboring with people and we think, well, they, they should be doing this or they should be doing that, we need to stop and just back up and make sure that the, the beam is out of our own eye before we judge the mote in their eye. Another thing that we need to do is we need to be a good example. Um, if, you're, if your spouse is depressed and you are trying to help him become less depressed and you are just as negative as he is, that's not going to work very well. Um, we have to emulate the types of things that we want other people to do. The scripture here is from Alma. We're almost to that in Come Follow Me. should be in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, this is Alma talking to his son, Corianton, and uh, where they went on a mission together. And Corianton, instead of teaching like he should, he went off and found a prostitute and committed adultery. Um, and it was, uh, it was embarrassing to, um, and detrimental to the cause. What Alma says in this scripture as he's talking to his son, he says, Behold, O my son, how great iniquity you brought upon the Zoramites, for when they saw your conduct, they would not believe in my words." So even Alma, the younger, despite his amazing teaching abilities, um, when the people knew what his son had done, they wouldn't listen to him. So we need to be good examples as well. And what I mean by this is that we can't just put on a brave face and say everything's fine. Uh, you may have heard the very beginning, if you had tuned in, um, my co-presenter tonight, Gaynel Lynn, is not feeling particularly well. And she went on Instagram Live to tell people that she's not feeling very well and, and to be patient with her. Um, and uh, and then went and put on earrings and lipstick anyway, and she's ready to go. But sometimes we pretend like there's nothing wrong. Um, oh, depression. Yeah, that sounds really bad. Never really experienced any of it myself, but I'm sure that you're going through some difficult things. Of course, we've been through stuff. And why can't we just admit it? Why can't we just admit that we've struggled and or currently struggle as well? Quite frankly, we need those kinds of examples. We don't need examples of perfect people. We have one, it's our Savior Jesus Christ, and we don't need any others. What we need are examples of people who struggle. We need people who, who can show that it's okay. It's okay to be broken. 
it's okay to have difficulties and we still get up and, and go forward anyway. Um, so be a good, be a good imperfect example to others. Okay, last theme here, um, accepting mental health issues as part of our mortal probation and growth process. Oftentimes we look at mental health as some as this sort of cancerous growth that needs to be removed, or sorry, mental health issues as this cancerous growth that needs to be removed. Um, and wouldn't it be better if I just had no weakness? I could get through life without any troubles. Well, no, it wouldn't be better actually, it would be worse. Um, these are the Jaredite barges. I don't know if that's how they look like. If that looks tight like unto a dish to you, then then that's a good Jaredite barge. Um, we can't eliminate trials, especially the ones the Lord has ordained for you. You have your own list of trials. There's a big plan of salvation, capital P plan of salvation. And I think there's a lowercase p plan of salvation for every single one of us. And it has a big subsection on trials as well. Those are your trials that Heavenly Father has ordained for you in this life for your growth. And I don't think they can be avoided. So, oh, sorry, going back. So when the Jaredites went across the ocean, 344 days was what it took. It said the Lord caused a furious wind to blow upon the face of the water. And for 344 days, so almost an entire calendar year, they were stuck in these barges as they blew from ancient, ancient uh, the old world to the new world. But we got some options here. Helaman 10, 16, Nephi was taken by the Spirit and conveyed away out of the midst of them. A different Nephi, uh, Lehi's son, was caught away in the Spirit of the Lord unto an exceedingly high mountain. So clearly the Lord has these kind of teleportation systems that he can use to take people places. So why not take the Jaredites, take them from the shores of the Indian Ocean or wherever they were and plop them down in San Diego 20 seconds later? when clearly he had that option. Well, let me tell you why. This is Ether 612. This is after they landed and they did land upon the shore of the promised land. And when they had set their feet upon the shores of the promised land, they bowed themselves down upon the face of the land and did humble themselves before the Lord and did shed tears of joy before the Lord because of the multitude of his tender mercies over them. Now, I do not believe that they would have humbled themselves and shed tears of joy if they had tra been transported from the shores of the Indian Ocean to San Diego in 20 seconds. They would have said, wow, that was pretty cool. Let's do that again. This is something they remembered for the rest of their lives. Um, I have been on a lot of uh, <laughs> young men activities growing up, and I don't remember hardly any of them. Any of them. You know what I do remember? I remember Trek because Trek was hard. That was really, really hard. And that stuck out in my mind. Um, those difficult things we tend to remember, and that can give us strength later on. Another scripture, Ether 12, 27. Oh, this is such a great scripture. And if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me, for if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. And as a recipe, um, we go to God and he shows us our weakness. He says, here, let me show you where you're weak. Thank you very much. Um, I already knew that, but he does. He shows it to us and he, he gives us weakness. Not, not, not just the vicissitudes of life. He gives us weakness so that we can be humble and if we humble ourselves before him and have faith in him, then those weak things can become strong. We can grow because of that. That's why we have mental health challenges. That's why we have other challenges for this purpose so that we can be humble, so that we can have faith and we can grow and those things can become strong unto us. Why would we eliminate trials if there's such a glorious outcome to them? There is a glorious outcome. We got to get there. It takes work on our part and we will get there. And like... Um, like it says in that scripture, his grace is sufficient. Um, you remember when uh, Nephi and Laman and Lemuel were um, trying to get the brass plates and uh, Laman um, fails as he comes back and Nephi says, we got to go back and Laman and Lemuel say, we can't. He says, he can command 50. He could even slay 50. Why not us? And Nephi kind of looks at them incredulously and he says, who the heck is Laban with his 50 or even his tens of thousands? The Lord can do everything. So who's, so what is depression? What is anxiety? What is, 
bipolar disorder, what is anything else that you can conceive of compared to the Lord's power? It's nothing. He can fix it every single time. And he will and in his timetable and through his grace. But we need to learn from it first. We need to learn those things that are going to help us become more like him. Um, and then I think is when he takes that away. Okay, I'm going to hopefully you're going to hear some audio on this. And if not, then we'll see. I'm curious to you if you might have a question that you would like to ask President Nelson. You're sitting here with the prophet. Is there anything that you've always wanted to ask a prophet? Yes, girl. Is it hard to be a prophet? Of course it's hard. Everything to do with becoming more like the Savior is difficult. For example, when God wanted to give the Ten Commandments to Moses, where did he tell Moses to go? Upon the top of a mountain. On the top of Mount Sinai, so Moses had to walk all the way up to the top of that mountain to get the Ten Commandments. Now, Heavenly Father could have said, Moses, you start there, and I'll start here, and I'll meet you halfway. <laughs> no, the Lord loves effort. Because effort brings rewards that can't come without it. For example, do you ever take piano lessons? And do you practice? What happens if you don't practice? No, you don't progress, do you? So the answer is yes, Pearl. It takes effort, a lot of hard work, a lot of study, and there's never an end. That's good. That's good. Because we're always progressing. Even in the next life, we're making progress. Okay, can I just take a minute and testify that President Nelson is a prophet of God? I just love him. Um, let's talk about the few things that he talked about. Don't you love Pearl's question? Is it hard to be a prophet? Are you like really busy? Oh, Pearl, if your parents are listening, save that video. You're going to want to show that at your wedding or something like that because that's comedy gold. Um, this is what President Nelson says. Everything to do with becoming more like the Savior is difficult. The Lord loves effort because effort brings rewards that can't come without it. And it takes effort, a lot of hard work, a lot of study, and there's never an end. And then he says, that's good. And Sister Jones kind of nods her head in agreement. I remember hearing that last uh, sentence there and going, oh, geez. And there's never an end. There's never an end. And But there isn't. And that's okay, because we're here to learn to become better. And we're always progressing, just like President Nelson said. But it's supposed to be difficult, brothers and sisters. It's supposed to be hard um, because that's why that's how we get better. And that's why and we apply that effort. So it's difficult because Heavenly Father makes it hard. And then we apply the effort. We take responsibility and we work hard to make it better. And the combination of those two things brings about miracles. All right. Um, that's my website again. If you again, if you have any questions for me www.ldspsychologist.com. I'm going to um, turn off the uh, slideshow here real quick and um, just leave you with my testimony. First, just a quick anecdote. It's my favorite anecdote. Uh, there's a guy walking down the street and he falls into a hole. It's too deep. He can't get out of. And so he's yelling and screaming at the people uh, walking by saying, hey, hey, I'm stuck in this hole. Let me out. And um, his doctor walks by, his physician walks by, and he says, Doc, Doc, I'm stuck down in the hole. And so she uh, writes down a prescription and throws it in the hole. And then his uh, bishop walks by, he says, Bishop, hey, Bishop, I'm stuck in the hole. So the bishop pulls out a copy of the Book of Mormon and highlights a couple of scriptures and tosses it in the hole. And then, um, then his friend comes by. He says, Jim, Jim, hey, I'm stuck down in the hole. And uh, Jim jumps in the hole. Sorry, I, I I really like this. And he says, um, and he says, Jim, you big dummy, what are you doing? Now we're both stuck down here. But Jim says, Yeah, but I've been down here before, and I know the way out. And um, to me, that just is our savior, because he's been through everything. 
um, the enabling power of the of his atonement talks about how he's been he suffered everything on our behalf so that we can get through anything and so there's there's no hole that you can be in that the savior hasn't been in he's been in every single hole um and he knows the way out and so he can help you out every single time but you have to go to him and you have to do what he asks um i know that that's true let me share my testimony with you that i know that the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints is god's kingdom here on earth Absolutely, it, this, the ongoing restoration is amazing. President Nelson is prophet of God and the rightful successor to Joseph Smith who, who brought about this work, um, who I love and can't wait to meet him, express my gratitude in person. Uh, the Book of Mormon is true and there are answers in there. They're gonna help you throughout your life and answers they're gonna help you with your mental health issues, not because it speaks about your mental health issues, but because it's gonna inspire you and the Lord's gonna to speak to you specifically with revelation as you're studying from those pages. And I know that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Um, he did everything for us and suffered tremendously so that we don't have to suffer as much as he did. And we never will if we choose to repent. So I encourage you to go to him Reach out to him every day. Ask him for help. Ask him to teach you. Ask Heavenly Father to teach you how to get better. And you're going to find miracles. It's going to require work, but there's going to be miracles in your life. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Wow. Um, Brother Morgan, thank you. That was um, truly fantastic. Um, such a powerful way to communicate so much truth and i think so much hope you know um we're gonna bring gaina lynn on in just a second uh and, and dr morgan there's some great questions that have rolled in that uh we'll be able to address um absolutely towards towards the conclusion but i wanted to just add three quick things um uh, not that anything you said needs additions just thoughts that came to my mind you know when you were talking about president nelson uh and you were talking about the uh, the quote about repentance i served my mission in berlin germany and uh, german is a language that is near and dear to my heart and there were certain words in the german language that helped me understand gospel principles more fully one of those is the word for repentance in german is umkehr now the literal translation means to turn to or to turn from right and i always i what president nelson says in that quote reminds me that it's not it just as you said it's not just i didn't read my scriptures i need to repent it's this entire turning of one's self and one's soul to the purest source of love and support and all of the good things that we need and it really is to turn oneself not just to kneel and pray and you know maybe you know exclaim that you're sorry for something that you did and we know the steps of repentance but that those steps that they there is a turning that could take place so i love that thank you for that a wholesale change of everything it's 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 a complete change yeah not just little stuff big big change i love that so much uh the other the other thought that i had is um when we were talking about it's gonna be difficult um, you know, we know that there'll be opposition in all things, but I love that in the same chapter of the Book of Mormon, where we're told that there's going to be oppositions in all things, we're also told that men are that they might have joy. Yeah. And I've always found comfort in that, knowing that no matter how difficult it may get, no matter how many of those moments may seem hopeless, God created us so that we may have joy. Were it not for that, we would not be here. There must therefore be a way. And so I love that. I was reminded of that. And uh, the last thing is I have a quote on my monitor that I always think about um, from uh, Elder Uchtdor. And he says, you know, in, in the spirit of what President Nelson said, and by the way, I love that quote from President Nelson that the Lord loves effort because effort brings rewards that can't come without it. Um, incredible. Elder Uchtdorf has this, this uh, quote on work that I love. He says, work, because I think about it in terms of mental health too. He says, work is an antidote for anxiety, an ointment for sorrow, and a doorway to possibility. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of good that comes through that effort and work. Any final, just little thoughts before we turn it over to Gaina Lynn? 
No, that's absolutely right. I appreciate those um, those thoughts as well. Yeah, it's it, we're here to do the work, but we don't have to do it alone. We have to work, but but we're gonna have we're gonna work with the Savior side by side, and so and that's the best part about it is that um, He's gonna be with us every step of the way as long as we go to Him. So yeah, best, awesome, best teammate in the world. Yeah, in the <laughs> in the eternities. Thank you, Brother Morgan. What a wonderful, wonderful message. Thank you so much. You. So everybody uh, watching, stick around because we're going to have some good questions for Brother Morgan afterwards. If you've got questions or if questions come up, whether you are, uh, you know, whether you're just joining us and you've got a question about mental health, mental illness, or how we can find hope in hopeless times, put it in the chat, wherever you're watching us. Or if you've got questions for Gaina Lynn, who's going to come up here in a second. Um, please put those in. Now, I am so excited for you guys. Uh, I'm so excited that you get to hear from this fabulous, wonderful, amazing friend of mine, Gaina Lynn Condi. Now, if you've never heard Gaina Lynn, you're in for a treat. She is um, one of the most passionate and empowered speakers that I've ever heard. And her testimony, her the way she communicates truth and ideas, it just plain resonates. Um, she's magical. Um, which is why uh, my nickname for her is the queen of all things good, which I told her earlier. Uh, but I'm, she, I'm she, gonna get a t-shirt made, Kevin. <laughs> That's good. Uh, I think we should. It would look really good. I am just so thankful that you're here, Gaina Lynn. And for those that don't know Gaina Lynn, she is a prolific author. She's authored many books. She has many talks that you can go and find at Siegel Book or Desert Book, and you should. You should listen to every single one of them and listen to them 100 times over. Um, She's amazing. And one of the things that I really respect about Gaina Lynn is not only has she um, experienced healing from major chronic illness, so she knows what it's like to be in those depths. Um, she's also the mother to two miracle children. And I remember the first time I ever heard you, Gaina Lynn, I remember you telling the story about the heartbreaking suicide of your 40-year-old sister. And um, I saw in you this kindred spirit of prevention um, I've worked a lot with a nonprofit here in Utah and gone and spoke at so many schools about how to find joy and and about suicide prevention and 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 uh, and intervention and even postvention. And um, hearing your perspective on these issues is truly valuable, something I know that has stuck with me. And Gaynalyn, I don't know if you know this, so I'm just gonna share this with you real quick. Hey. You have a few videos and you have some content that you've uh, thankfully put into the world about, some of the struggles that your sister had and about um, when she, as you always put it, when she chose to leave her body. And uh, I had an opportunity, I'd gone and spoke in California, um, just about you know my little book. I had an opportunity to chat and we had a great time. I had a gentleman uh, that I kind of connected with there and he messaged me on Facebook months later. And he said, Kev, I've got a friend, I don't know him personally, but I know him through gaming. And uh, he is really struggling with some things right now. Now, this individual was not a member of the church. And uh, I, I connected with this individual. I tried to share the gospel with them. And I tried to share with him videos and books and ideas and things that made a difference because I knew he was in it. And uh, one of the things that I shared that I know made a big difference for him was some of your content and some of the videos that you've, um, that you've put out there that are on YouTube about um, suicide or suicide prevention or some of those things. And uh, I just want you to know that uh, my new friend Tyler found comfort in those videos. So thank you for putting those into the world. And so uh, with that, I, I appreciate your, your generous spirit. And um, I, I know you do the work for the same reason to do it for the one. And so anytime I hear about the one, especially after a challenging few weeks, which I've had, it's it's always for me God's way of knocking me upside the head and saying, keep going, girl. So I'm going to just keep going. Good. Um, because one of the philosophies I live by in this life is just try to leave everybody better off than you find them every single moment that you get. And you are a brilliant example of just that. And so I'm going to hush it. I'm going to turn it over to you, brothers and sisters, my friends watching, wherever you may be watching from, the fabulous, the amazing. Gaina Lynn Condi. Thanks, Kevin. So grateful to have the opportunity to present with these two amazing brothers in the gospel. And for those of you that are familiar with me, um, we're already family. 
But for those that may be new to who I am and what I'm about, I'm excited to get to know you. Dr. Morgan shared some amazing things. And I feel like the spirit, it always creates the best balance in a meeting. And so it's wonderful to see uh, how he shared some of the things I talk about and then do it in his way. But one thing I will say is he ended with that story, which if you've been to an onward event, you may have heard me share that same story. I get emotional at the same point. I may have to ask him later um, where I first heard that little small, you know, story about the man falling in the pit was on one of my favorite TV shows. And it's always stuck with me. And I'm going to be honest, for those of you that I've connected with on social media before tonight, I got on there and shared that I've been sick. And I've been in bed all day until a little bit before we came on live. And I have been uh, battling my own mental health stuff the last few weeks. And so this isn't something that I teach from a place of I get there and I'm done. I'm working on my mental health every day. And I appreciate Kevin's generous introduction. I try to teach from this place of authenticity. And I appreciate some of the uh, stories in the scriptures that were mentioned already, because I believe the scriptures are a permission slip for us to be more authentic about what's really going on in our lives. And I never read a story in the scriptures that is the perfect family that has the perfect answers that have no issues. And yet somewhere, somewhere along the way on a cultural level in the gospel, we very much have expected that from ourselves. And that very much is a reminder to me that I am often brought to my knees. And the last few days I have been, but after doing a number of speaking events all over the world, I've come to know that this is God's work. It's not about me. I'm just one of the instruments onward uh, invites millions of you to join and presents with different instruments of God, great presenters. And we all have something unique to share. And I'm grateful that onward uh, works so hard to make sure these events happen, but I I'm okay with teaching from a really honest place. So that's what you're going to get tonight. So if you've watched my hope works talk, which came out uh, last fall, I talked about hope in a way that I've talked about at Onward events and in, in different settings. But every time I share it, it, it is a reminder to me. And it is also a reminder to those that maybe have never considered hope as something different than a feeling. So after Meg died, my sister that died by suicide, I was wrestling with grief. And I have another sister that died when I was 10. She was two. So I have two sisters that are buried by each other, unfortunately, in the same cemetery. And my grandparents are there in the same family plot. And I was very close with them. I held my grandma in bed when she passed. And she was, she was a, an important part, instrumental in shaping who I am today. And I remember wrestling with this whole other grief. I had said goodbye to grandparents and I'd said goodbye to a father-in-law and I'd said goodbye to my, my baby sister, Bonnie. But suicide grief created this very crazy what if pit, like Dr. Morgan talked about, where I could fall into it. And I also can fall into the pit of perfectionism. Maybe you can relate to that. I can fall into the pit of anxiety. And I can be very self-critical if I'm not careful. And I was wrestling that that first year after Meg died with grief. My first book, uh, I Can Do Hard Things With God, was coming out. I was speaking already. And that really did save my life. I feel like the grief was, was a mission for me. But a friend of mine that's a therapist shared with me that hope is not a feeling. It is a plan B. And I love that idea of of reframing. So oftentimes I need to reframe. I've been stuck in some of my stories the last few days in my head. Do you know what I mean by that? Uh, Pohorin and Moroni are great examples in the Book of Mormon. There are two guys that had stories going on in their heads and they had reason. You know, nothing that's going on in the world right now from the pandemic to political unrest to racial unrest to changes in our summer schedules and our school schedules and and uh, economic stress, none of that's like no big deal. This is all big deal stuff. The temples are closed. That's where 
I would be crawling to right now. That's where I have gotten so much strength and solace over the last few years. And I'm going to talk about that in a, in a few minutes more specifically. But those are closed, right? So, so much has changed and so much is intense right now. And there's a lot of vulnerability. And when there's a lot of vulnerability, sometimes our stories can go unchecked. And that's why I advocate, as Dr. Morgan did, to have a therapist to check those stories. That's one of the great tools in my toolbox. But this friend of mine said, hope is not a feeling. And, and for me, the million dollar question of why Meg died was that she lost hope, that she believed the lie that we would be better without her. And so I will spend the rest of my life, and I have the last six years, sharing a message that we will never be better without any of you, without without me on the earth and without Kevin and Sunrisa and, and Messi and Elaine. I'm just seeing some of the beautiful people here joining us today. Dr. Morgan and is it Nita, Mona Lisa, uh, at Arvin, Arvin, uh, these, all of you, there's nothing about this world that would be better without any of us. And my life is not better without my Meg, you know, but when you lose hope, it very much, makes the lies feel like truth. And so the reframe that hope isn't a feeling, it's a plan B, it is a lot of what Dr. Morgan has just talked about. It opens the door to a plan C, a plan D, a plan E and F. And I've talked about that before and I'll keep talking about it because so often when we struggle and we fall into a pit and we get stuck there sometimes, we don't feel like there's another plan, another tool, another hopeful step to take. But if we can reframe it like, I don't feel it, it's okay. We're going to decide it today. So my prayer is that I'm going to break down hope. I love little patterns because I think it helps us remember, especially when our brains feel cluttered, when our emotions feel overwhelming, when we're tired. I like to have little acronyms, and analogies, my kids tease me all the time because I always want to have an analogy. Well, 4th of July, we were, we were uh, like all of you, coming up with a plan B. And in our family, uh, my son, who's 22, who I've talked about a lot, I've written about him. He's been home from his mission 18 months from Africa, from Zimbabwe. You know, what I'm going to say is he really loves 4th of July. For him, 4th of July is better than Christmas. He would take 4th of July over Christmas any day. And so here we're, where we live um, on the Wasatch Front, I'm looking out my window of my office because everyone's driving by waving at me right now. They don't know I'm doing a fireside with all my favorite people and onward. And um, they, where we live here has the biggest parade and the greatest fireworks show and we bite them we buy the matching t-shirts and we do all the things and this year none of that was going to happen and so you know i teach this principle of hope is a plan b about pivoting and adapting like the navy seals say and so i'm trying to think of plan b so the plan b this year was we were going to i still ordered the matching t-shirts we have no picture of all four of us together because my son lives in provo and we live in lehigh but my plan was we were going to have a new plan b we're still going to make 4th of July a special day. And so we decided to go down the Provo River. And because of COVID-19, you had to schedule time. And we scheduled for our time. And we showed up all the life preservers, all the life jackets. You had to have one to go on the river and rent this tube and whatever. They were all out. So we waited two hours in the hot sun waiting for the life jackets to come back and so that we could get on the river. And as we were waiting in line for this two hours, right, I'm telling myself, like, this is a pivot moment. Like, we're going to come up with a new plan B. And I saw over to the side of the trail we were standing on waiting. This, this trail led to where people had to get out of the river. And so you would take their life jackets and you'd go get on a bus and then the, the bus would take you up the river. And then you'd float all the way back down to that point, get off and hand your life preserver off. There was a broken oar on the side. Now, listen. We're going to talk about the broken oar, but if you have all ever watched my YouTube video about this or heard me speak about it at an onward event about my broken rake, my family kind of rolled their eyes like, oh no, we are going to have a broken oar on our wall in our house, much like our broken rake in our basement. And I was almost tempted, but there was something cool that happened with the oar and so I left it for somebody else. But this is what 
what we were doing. So we finally get on this river. Now, listen, we're boiling hot because we've been standing outside for, you know, two hours. And yet, as as sweaty and hot as we were, the river was freezing. So we have our inner tubes. We each have our tube. Okay. All four of us. So my husband and I, my son and my daughter, my daughter's 16. And we walk down the river bank to get into the river. And I was in shock. Like when parts of my body hit the river, I was like, whoa, why was this a good idea? You know? And so basically I was trying to sit in the tube so that really no part of my body would hit the water, which wasn't possible. So we get into the river and we start to float down this river. And I'm going to tell you this for a moment there. The sun was so beautiful and shining and I had visions of like, okay, we're two hours behind schedule. That means this isn't going to happen. And this isn't going to happen after we go down the river. And I was trying to stay positive, you know, because hope is a plan B, not a feeling. And I, I had visions of us floating together as a unit. Well, my son immediately goes ahead of me and I've got my little broken oar and they're all making fun of me a little bit. And I, I get pushed off to the other side of the river behind my son and my husband and daughter stick together in the back. I'm thinking, this is not how I visualize it. Can you relate to this? Can you relate on a mental health standpoint how easy it is to feel like what we're dealing with in life right now is not at all what we thought it would be? You know, like every day we wake up and there's some news headline for our for our family here in Lehigh, you might have seen on CNN, we had fires. We've had earthquakes in Utah. We, you know, I just read on CNN a couple weeks ago, there was huge, massive jellyfish on the East Coast that were four feet in diameter and the tentacles were 10 feet long. There's days that I think, has Jesus not come yet? So th that there was this moment on the river that I had to really deal with the shock of the cold and then appreciate the sun. And I thought about times in my life I have felt shock. You know, in mental health standpoint, I love that Dr. Morgan talked about being careful about overdiagnosing ourselves. But I think in a very real sense, especially with the loss of my sisters and some other trauma in our family, I have some significant PTSD responses to certain things. And if I'm not careful, the stories in my head have evidence to pull from. And so it's easy to feel the shock of what's happening in our lives, much like the cold water. But I've also come to know that as I look up, that warmth of the sun is always there. I love Dr. Morgan's testimony and what Kevin shared about the Savior. He's there for our chronic illness diagnoses, for our mental health diagnoses, for our job losses, for our miscarriages, for our addictions, for our learning disabilities. He's there for it all. So I would first and foremost say that it, it's okay to acknowledge the shock. And as I went down the river, the shock started to wear off. It was still obvious we were in a cold river. There were parts of the river that were awesome in that they were super relaxing and we were kind of floating together. And then there were other parts that it was very shallow and it was very much rapid. And I was getting tossed to and fro. And if I wasn't careful, I'd get caught over in the side with the branches that were hitting my head. And then I was getting better at knowing how to use my hands and my oar. I kept going backwards. Do you feel that way? Do you feel like when it comes to mental health or even spiritual health or emotional health or physical health that everyone's going the right direction and you're the one floating backwards and you keep getting stuck in the weeds? That's exactly what I was feeling. And I, I yelled up to my son and I said, you know what? This Provo River run is going to be an analogy for a talk I give. And it's not even August yet. And I'm, and I'm sharing it with you. Well, as we were getting used to the river process and it was kind of crowded and there were fishermen along the way. And I kept feeling bad for all these fly fishermen because I was like, we're totally messing them up. And every fisherman except one, I probably talked to like 22 on the river that day. I counted all of them except one said that the fishing was great, that all these people on the river kicking and screaming and yelling and music playing and tubes popping. It didn't affect them at all. One fisherman was a little grumpy, but everybody else was really happy. And I thought that was interesting. You know, they were enjoying the river the way they wanted to enjoy the river. But the H 
that I want to talk about in hope that day was looking up at heaven. As I was getting used to this cold water and the sun, all of a sudden my son was a little ahead of me and I see him. It's kind of the calm part of the river. If you've ever gone down the Provo River and he, all of a sudden I could tell he was just thinking and relaxing. All of a sudden he looked up. There was nothing above us. There was no sounds. There was nothing. And I saw him look and look around as if he was trying to find something. And then I saw him see something. And I said, what, what is it? I yelled up to him. He said, it's a bald eagle. I said, what? So then I looked around and I could look just a little bit past the tree. I just passed behind me and there was a bald eagle in the tree. Well, the people behind me said, what? What are you guys looking at? And I said, there's a bald eagle. Well, then they all got excited in their raft and they all looked up at the bald eagle. And then the people behind them saw what they were doing and they all looked up. I said to my son, how did you know it was there? He said, something told me inside, look up. My friends, that's how the spirit is talking to us. The H in hope I want you to remember is heaven is near. And sometimes when we're dealing with mental health issues, we don't look up. We get so caught looking down at our pain. And I've been there. I promise you the last two days I've been there. I'm not saying this because I've got it perfectly figured out that we stop looking up. And whether it's the cold shock of trauma like the water felt that day because you've gone through some loss, re really realizing that the sun, I love that Onward Productions, their logo right here is a sun. It's there just like the son of God is there. But sometimes if we don't listen to those whispers, we ignore them. We miss the beauty of that creation of God that has been sent to remind us we're not alone. I know that day. My son needed to know that he could hear the voice. Because sometimes we wonder, right? We talk to ourselves and we think, is that me or is that God? I love that H is that heaven is near. I love that there is an opposition in all things. I think of Joseph Smith going into the grove. That sacred grove was not sacred until he went to hand-to-hand -hand combat with Satan first. Then the angels came and then heaven appeared and open up to him as a young 14 year old boy. So if you're battling some opposition, if you've got some cold shock that you're floating through right now, I'm gonna invite you in hope to remember H. H is that heaven is near and that you can look up because the sun is there. And sometimes heaven even sends even something extra like an eagle. O oh, in hope is about this ore, this broken ore that I had, that everyone was making fun of me. Now listen, there were big rafts. There was even a big inner tube that was shaped like a rainbow unicorn. I was a fan of that tube the whole time, okay? Because you can't be grumpy even in cold water when there's a floating unicorn that keeps passing you. There were moments where the river was taking me right along and then it would slow so much down or I would get pushed over because of the current to the wrong side and get caught in the trees. My little broken oar had a broken handle and it was a perfect size for sitting in a tube and using it instead of just my hands paddling. There were points where it whacked the big trees that were about to decapitate me as I got pushed over to the side. That little broken oar became a, a gift. A little gift for me to help me. And at some point, my son, who had been mocking me, asked to borrow the broken oar. And I said, you mean the one you've been making fun of me the whole time? And he became a fan of it. And I said, I think I'm going to take it home and hang it on the wall with the broken rake. But I left it for the next YouTube, the next tuber, not YouTuber. That would have been funny. The next tuber that was needing it going down the river because it was so helpful for me. It reminds me of another oar. I'm not talking O-A-R, like a broken oar for the boat that I had for my tube. I'm talking O-R-E, like in the story of, Je of Nephi, who found a deposit of ore. I love this story because God had asked Nephi to build a ship. And from what we understand of Lehi's family, they didn't live on the coast. They weren't shipbuilders. And he didn't have Pinterest. And he couldn't go to YouTube and find a video on how to build a ship to get you to the promised land. And so he had to really rely on God. And he needed tools. And what God gave him first to do this really hard thing 
was a deposit of ore. What I love about this story is this ore deposit wasn't just for Nephi. It was there for everyone. And Dr. Morgan did a really great job of showing you some deposits of ore that you can go to to make tools. So just like as I could have been grumpy and irritated that our, you know, parade was canceled and our, you know, fireworks show wasn't going to happen. And we were two hours late getting on the river and my life jacket was su super small, didn't really even fit. I would have missed this broken oar left for me on this side that proved to be super helpful for my adventure down the river that day. So where are your deposits of O-R-E, or? When you think of the word hope, I want you to think of O as an O for or. What are the spiritual gifts that God has given you, endowed you with before you came to earth to do the mission you have come to earth to do? Do you think he's surprised by your learning disability, your addiction, your depression, your anxiety, your chronic illness, your loneliness, your singleness, your infertility? No. I've come to know that as we wrestle with the Lord to build the ships that we don't know how to do to get to the promised lands that he has for us, that he will put deposits of O-R-E in our path. And sometimes that's a good therapist. That's medication. It's a, it's a trusted friend. It's a fireside like this where you can gather a, a deposit of ore to make a tool that will help you tomorrow and the next day so that you can keep choosing the next plan B. P in hope is plan B. What are the plan Bs that have come to your mind tonight? Kevin invited you to consider the one thing. Maybe for you, it's something that Dr. Morgan said or something I'm sharing or Kevin has said. Is it therapy? Is it time to exercise and get out in the sunshine each day? Is it that you've let your prayer practice go and you need to start writing your prayers out because the depression is so bad, you're not really sure how to hear God through the prayer. So you start writing them out. I love that Nephi had to keep getting a plan B to build the ship. And what he says in the scriptures is that he went up to the mount oft. And the mount in the scriptures is also AKA for the temple. And so we see that he didn't go to Pinterest, but he went to the Lord. He went to God. And sometimes we have to change our surroundings so we can hear God more. Last Sunday, we didn't have church at the church. Today we did. My family went because I was home in bed um, trying to get rid of that fever. But last week I was in charge of our Sunday service and we live close to a temple. And so the temple's closed, but we took our folding chairs and our scriptures and our journals and we had a little prayer and then we went off and we had some quiet on the mount time. And then we came back and counseled together. I think I'm going to do that again this week because I need some more help. I need some more direction on building of this ship to get to my promised land. I invite you to go to the source who has designed all the ships. He knows all the plans. He knows what he's endowed you with. I know Nephi became a great prophet because he had crazy brothers that taught him to rely on God above all else. And that was what got him through so many of those hard times. Finally, E. H is heaven. O is or. P is a plan B. And E is endure to the end. As Kevin shared with you, one of the things I like to say and post and hashtag and repeat and, and scream from rooftops is stay in your body. I miss my Meg. And part of that river trip taught me that it's about getting to the end and not pulling out. As we went down the river, I noticed popped rafts and tubes that were abandoned on the side of the river. And I wondered what was the story of who had been in those tubes or in those boats and how did they get to where they needed to go? I also noticed at certain points, people had just gotten out, you know, they had just gotten out and sat along the side and some of them were partying and drinking. And, and I thought, you know, isn't that how it feels in the world sometimes that you're staying in the boat and you're trying to live the first strength of youth. You're trying to keep your temple recommend. You're trying to pay your tithing. You're trying to keep doing come follow me and there's no church and you're trying to do your ministering with COVID-19 and you're trying and everyone else looks like they're jumping out and they're, they're having a party in the great and spacious building. My invitation to you is to really look to 
the Book of Mormon this year. I host a Come Follow Me show called Real Talk, Come Follow Me. I have an amazing co-host, Scott Sorensen. He's a seminary teacher. He will be teaching this year at Sky Ridge High School where my daughter goes. And he deals with depression and anxiety and he's very open about it. And we try to do 20 minute Come Follow Me lessons each week, which is sometimes challenging when the lessons are 10 chapters. We just taped all of August this last week. And it's basically the middle of Alma to the middle of Helaman. It's a lot. It's a lot. And it's the war chapters. And I've come to love the war chapters in the Book of Mormon because it's not about fighting a war, but we're all fighting a war. So it's not a war of guns and armies. It's the war inside of us. And what I love about the Book of Mormon is I've come to know it to be my Leahona, to help me know how to endure, to stay. Opposition has been a part of the plan. The current of the river is what literally pushed us forward. And sometimes we want that pushing to stop. But what I noticed at the times when the river got really still, that was nice for a minute, but I wanted to keep going. There was so much to see in. There were times on the river that it was too much. It was too shocking. It was too rough. It was too scary. And sometimes it got really slow. And at one point, our family finally did come together for a minute. We were all four tubes together. And classic me, fun fact, I like to sing Christmas songs, play Christmas music and movies at all times of the year. And so I thought 4th of July on the rover was a perfect time to be singing some Christmas songs. So I did. And I want you to know that in that moment, I was clear that we are in a war and we need to fortify, just like in the Book of Mormon, where sometimes we have to build up the low places and we need to assess where are we strong? Where do we need support? I know that there was a lot shared tonight, and I hope something was shared in a way for you to know that's a new instrument, a new tool, a new weapon, a new fortification, so that you can e endure to the end. Because I don't want to lose any more of my brothers and sisters. I don't want anyone jumping out of the river before it's their time. I know God has endowed and prepared us for 2020. He knew how crazy it would be. And every one of us on the planet at this time are going to have to dig deep. We're going to have to know more about God and how to hear him as our prophet has asked us to do. He's asked us to hear him because what spiritual strength we had before was will not be enough. And man, I can testify that is true. I miss my Meg every day. She's my mission companion in this work. I feel her often with me, comforting me and inviting me to keep going, to speak for both of us because she can't. And I'll share with you what I've shared thousands of times before. Please stay in your body because we will never be better without you. I hope that tonight you have a renewed hope for H, heaven, to see the O or to have a P, plan B, and to E, endure to the end. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, as always, Ginalyn, my goodness, thank you so, so, so much. Um, boy, uh, brothers and sisters, you have been richly fed tonight. Um, look, I don't know why you signed on tonight. I don't know if it's because You've enjoyed all of these amazing virtual firesides that Onward Productions puts on. I don't know if it's because you saw the topic tonight and you thought, oh my goodness, I need to know how to have a little bit more hope. I don't know if you were just scrolling through your feed and you saw that there was a virtual fireside and so you just clicked on it and here you are. For whatever the reason is that you are here, I promise you and testify to you that there was a specific reason that the Lord brought you here tonight. And I want you, and I hope, and I encourage, I, I want you to search this production. I want you to search this fireside. Go back and listen. If that one thing didn't jump out, I know that it will. I would bet, I, I would wager that everybody watching heard that thing. Brothers and sisters, it now becomes your job to do something with it. Maybe that thing, is to reach out for the help that you've been afraid to reach out for. Reach out tonight. Maybe that thing is to realize that with the struggles you've had, it's time to go to the scriptures or to go to your knees and to humble yourself and say, I need this now. Heavenly Father, please be there with me. Maybe it's time 
maybe it's finally that moment tonight that told you I'm not broken. I'm I'm norm. This happens. You know, that is something that I know, Gaino Lynn, you've heard a lot. I know uh, Brother Morgan, Dr. Morgan, I'm sure you've heard a lot. People wonder sometimes with these feelings, these thoughts, these emotions, am, yeah. I, am I broken? Is that something that you hear, Dr. Yeah. Morgan or Gaino Lynn? I, you know what's so funny, Kevin? I think you were listening in on my conversation with my husband yesterday. I think you were because I literally I was, in the, I was in the closet, but don't worry about it. Yeah, <laughs> in the closet. There's a little fire in there. Go ahead, you can hang out in there. Uh, I wrote a book called "You Are More Than Enough. You Are Magnificent." I literally wrote a book that was a bestseller and won Best of State. And you would think it's tattooed on my soul that I wake up every day knowing I'm enough. And I'm magnificent. And the actual actual truth is, I I literally just said to my husband, maybe I'm just broken. You know, I've been working at my Plan Bs probably since the day I took my first breath. I was very aware of improvement and progress and healing trauma from my family dynamics and situations that had. I had no control over. I'm very cognizant that I need to keep working towards healing and improvement. And I, lately, I will just tell you that I have felt discouragement at a new level of not seeing any yield or fruit of that labor. And really like, wait, what is wrong? I see improvement in everyone else around me. I can see improvement in my kids, my husband, my friends, social media. Everyone seems to be rocking these goals and they've learned to make sourdough bread during COVID and they're running marathons. And, you know, I'm with Dr. Morgan. I just want to go to Disneyland. Let's just be clear about that. I don't, you know. Yeah. I, I don't even need, a, I just need a little, it's a small world and all would be right in the world and maybe, and maybe, you know, like um, a Dole Whip and then we're good. That's all, you know, a Dole Whip yeah. and the Tiki Room. I mean, yep. I don't need to get Let's crazy go. about it, yep. right? And so that's where I, I'm gonna just say that that, uh, I just taped the Come Follow Me episode about Lahante. And Lahante is one of my favorite stories because it tells us about the enemy. And the enemy in that story, it's the, if you're bored with the scriptures, you're not reading them because they're kind of rated M is, is what I'm going to say about that. <laughs> this, you know, it's this true. is the story of by degrees, he poisoned yeah. by degrees, he poisoned. And, and then he got the other guy to feel safe by bringing his guards halfway up the mountain. Right. That's what Satan does to me. He doesn't tell me straight up I'm a loser he just by degrees poisons me right to where we think well we're just so broken so to answer your question yes I, I feel that and I had a really negative review on my book you are enough because um the the reviewer said well if Gaina Lynn with all of her accomplishments doesn't feel enough then there's no hope for me are you kidding I know I know some of the most accomplished famous um educated, powerful people. They've become my friends in the last few years. And sometimes I quietly am their cheerleader because they don't feel enough. So if you think that anyone on the planet isn't walking around with a little bit of degrees of poison, then you don't really understand what I think President Eyring said, if we really understood that everyone's fighting a battle. Maybe I'm misquoting, it wasn't him, but we would be more kind to each other. That's, that's so true. And when I go, I've, I've had an opportunity to speak to a lot of youth, right, over the years, whether it's EFY or firesides like this or schools or whatever. And one of the things that I always communicate is exactly what you just said. I tell them, look, I know people from all walks of life in all different type of economic situations with all sorts of varying degrees of success and not a one of them, whether it is the most uh, the, the most Christ-like stake president or or the, you know, the, the most... Uh, you know, lowly, um, I don't know, Nick, fill in your adjective, right? Um, or noun. They've all felt at some point that they're, that they're maybe not quite enough or that they're not good enough. And, and I've thought about that so often. Why is it that each one of us who've been delivered to this world with this unbelievable power, this light of Christ, this ability to discover and live the gospel of Jesus Christ. How is it that even us here tonight who have the gospel of Jesus Christ, who've been taught and know some of these things, how could we still feel like we're not, a uh, like we're not enough? And to me, the answer is so clear. 
because there's one person who wants to make sure we never feel like we're good enough because he knows that if we feel that way, we will separate ourselves from the divine. And that individual is Lucifer. And there's no way he's not gonna tempt us. You know, there's no way he's not gonna make us feel like we're not enough because we've been singing since we were little that we are a child of God. And he's sent me here. And, and Satan doesn't want us to remember that. He doesn't want us to remember that there's divinity within us. He doesn't want us to remember that there's an atonement and that there is repentance and that there's prophets and apostles and that there's joy that can be found in the middle of all of it. Because as soon as we remember that, he loses his power and ability to influence us. Dr. Morgan, can anything you want to add? Amen? Can I get an amen? <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you a little story about um, about two years ago. I was so I'm self-employed, and so you know that's uh, you know varying stages of income throughout your life, as some of you know. And so I made the mistake of checking my 401k balance and then googling how much money do I need to retire, and uh, and the difference between those two amounts was staggering. And so yeah. I, I went into a state of anxiety for about the next 24 hours just worried about this and oh my gosh, how are we gonna do this and, and how are we gonna make, make ends meet? And so um, the next morning, it, it didn't, sleeping on it didn't help. I was still worried the next morning. And uh, as I'm leaving for work, my wife uh, comes to me and she says, hey, I prayed for you that you would um, have more peace today. And I said, well, thanks honey, but that's not gonna put more money in my 401k, right? I mean, I didn't say that, but uh, yeah. you know. That right. And so I get to work and, and I do a lot of evaluations for the welfare division here in the state of Washington. And this guy comes in for an appointment and he is homeless, like straight up homeless. I mean, he everything he owned, he had in a backpack. He was wet. It was in the winter. He'd been sleeping in the rain. He smelled wet, like wet clothing. Um, he comes and sits down in, my, in, in the chair and, and I asked him, like I do all these uh, clients when I'm doing the evaluations, I said, okay, well, what's I said, it says here that you struggle with anxiety and depression. So let's talk about that. And he says, he says, well, yeah, the anxiety is is still pretty bad, but the depression isn't so bad anymore because every day I get up and I just think of all the good things in my life. And um, and I could almost not continue with the interview because the spirit kind of, you know, put me in a in a chokehold and just said, that's what I'm talking about, David. He said, that's what I'm talking about. If this man sleeping in the rain can feel good about his life and you have a hard time feeling good about yours and your situation. It was just, it was wonderful. And it was an answer to my wife's prayer and it was in a very effective way of teaching me. Um, but you're right. Our perception of things and is, is so critical in life and, and Lucifer strives to change those perceptions, tries to uh, make them seem as, as not what they are. We, the scriptures talk about how truth is um, knowledge of, things as they were and as they are and as they are to come, right? I mean, that's that's what truth is. And that's what the Spirit teaches us is truth. And so as we fill our lives with the Spirit and the Scriptures and stuff like that, we'll have that truth and we'll have those clearer perceptions. That's wonderful. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we did get a couple questions. And so I want to just kind of go over these. I, so uh, I'm going to butcher her name, Son Sonrisa. Um, I can do the the oh, last. Lisa, name. That's because you didn't. Yeah. That's to Germany and not Mexico. Yeah, Maybe I know. But <laughs> the last name looks German. Hasselbach. Like that oh. one, I could do. There's phlegm in my throat when I say that name. That, that's that's a German. language. I, yeah. So she says, and I love this. What a great question. What's the best thing to say as a religious teacher to teenagers who come to you expressing their struggles with depression? Can I? Jump in there. Um, I, I've done, I don't know how many youth events and EFYs and firesides. And I just did a grief camp that's non LDS, non faith for kids that had lost someone. And that was very challenging because faith is very much one of my tools in my toolbox. So to talk to a group of people and not bring up faith in an overt way, I would just say as a religious leader, you have full permission to talk faith. But I love what Dr. Morgan said that if we just jump to scripture prayer, we're negating. I would say Elijah struggled with depression. He wanted to die when he had done a miracle and it didn't work the way he thought. If you look at George Albert Smith, he struggled with depression. 
So I think the first thing you do is you validate them and you celebrate that they're talking about it, that they're reaching out, that there's not something wrong with them. Um, I, I would also say share, share some of my Real Talk episodes because Scott shares, we did an interview with Leading Saints podcast, and he talks about the fact that he wished this thorn that would be removed. And, it, and, it, and he remembers the day God basically said to him that it would make him more of who he needed to be, not less of who he needed to be. So I would say first and foremost, validate them and tell them, yay, thank you for talking about it. And then to say, this isn't something wrong. This becomes a stewardship assignment, right? It's not all of who I am that I have lupus or that I had infertility or that I deal with anxiety. It's part of who I am. And so invite them to consider what is their spirit saying they need to do as a next step. And then one of the things I think is super helpful, especially as a religious leader, that allows you to say to them, how do you feel about sharing this with your parents? That it's important to loop, depending on if they're having feelings of self-harm uh, at all, they, they need you to say that to them. You got to dance, Kevin, to keep the light on. I know. I was, I was captivated by you, and I just couldn't move. Yeah, so I would just say, ask them, where is it out for you? Is the depression telling you things that, that are causing you to want to hurt yourself? Or are you feeling like you're needing some support just at the beginning? And then do your parents know about this? Because I think it's really, I have a lot of religious leaders reach out to me and say, so-and-so in my youth group is saying they're going to kill themselves. Are, are they just trying to get attention? And I always say, who cares? They're, they're, if they're trying to get attention, they're not well. So instead of thinking like they've got to have a full plan of execution, no pun intended, to get help, that they're crying for help regardless. And so I've often said to teenagers, because I get on this little phone here, I get through social media, some of the most heartbreaking messages every day of my life. I mean, it's a full-time job sometimes, especially certain seasons of the year, in spring especially, where teenagers reach out to me because they found me on Instagram and they trust me and they know I'll talk about it, but they don't want to tell their parents. And, and many times I'll say, it's time to get a therapist. Dr. David Morgan, we can go to his website and see what resources he has. But don't be the religious leader that thinks now it's all on your shoulders. So I would just say validate and celebrate. Assess how severe they are, they are. And then invite them to share with one other person, their parents, whatever. If it's very severe, then you get to say, I don't, I don't show you love by keeping this to myself. Right? I, I'm not being a loving support to you if I keep this to myself. That would be my 10 cents. <laughs> that's that's great counsel. Um, you didn't bill yourself as a therapist, Gail Lynn, but <laughs> it's not bad. Um, I would, uh, the only thing I would add to that is, and it's, and it's what Gail Lynn touched on just at the very beginning, is this idea that it's okay. Um, what, what usually happens is that like people have anxiety, you know, we talk about depression, but you use anxiety, and then they, they're anxious about the fact that they're anxious. They're like, I'm not supposed to be anxious. And then that anxiety starts to spin. If we could remove that, um, all that extra anxiety and stress over the fact that we have anxiety and stress or depression, or people are depressed about the fact that they're depressed, let's just go with the original depression, not this extra stuff that we're pouring on top of us and saying, I shouldn't be depressed. Well, it doesn't matter whether you should or you shouldn't be, you are. And that's okay. Let's figure out how to move forward. And not, oh, I, I, you know, I shouldn't be this way. And if I was more righteous and if I'd uh, listen to my parents, I wouldn't be that way because we don't know if that's true. Maybe um, there, there are some things that are ordained for us um, for our difficulty in life so that we can become more like Heavenly Father. And I don't think there's any way around them, no matter how we try to get around them. They always seem to come back and find us. And some of the and for some people, that may be depression. And that's going to be that thorn that Paul talked about that is just kind of chronically in his side, and he learned to glory in it um, and deal with it instead of saying, I'm broken and I'm there's something wrong with me. This is just kind of who I am, but I'm going to do something about it instead of throwing up my hands and saying, there's nothing I can do about it, because that's the danger in that radical acceptance is then we say, and I don't have to do anything about it. And then we're stuck. And, and if we don't act, then we don't progress. So it's okay to have those feelings and experiences um, and to acknowledge them. And like Gainalyn said, to, to, to look for help 
and, and definitely don't keep it to yourself. You got to talk to people about this stuff. Nothing ever. Uh, that's that's a that's too extreme. Things rarely get better when you just keep them to yourself. It's great. Um, we thank you both. Of you uh, unbelievable. It's amazing. Uh, we did have a couple people wonder, uh, Dr. Morgan, if you've read Jane Clayson's book, Silent Souls Weeping. Sounds like there's been some good um, feedback on that book. Is that one you're familiar with? Or would there's I'm familiar with it. I wonder? haven't read it yet, but I am familiar with it. I actually helped Jane a little bit on that, and it's wonderful. And my friend Seth contributed to it as well. Seth it did the Mormon message uh, sitting on the bench. And, and it is a great resource. You know, when I, when my first book came out, you, you, I can do hard things with God six years ago. There was really not an LDS perspective on, on some of these sensitive subjects. And I'm so grateful to see that there's more and more messaging around this topic because, um, I think there's still a shame factor that we're trying that hurdle. Dr. Morgan just talked about is still very, alive and well, not just in our LDS culture, but across the, the world. Yeah, I think what, and what Jane has done is been able to kind of break down that barrier a little bit uh, in, in showcasing um, the, just the examples of all these people who have struggled with these issues and just saying, because I think people read that and they go, oh my gosh, that's, I, I've, been, I've been going through that. I know what that's like. And I, I'm telling you, I, I want to have a big Zoom's probably not big enough, but let's get all 15 million of us together, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and let's have a big meeting where we can just, for once, just drop the pretense and say, we all struggle. We yeah. all struggle every day with something, and that's okay. Yeah. It's fine, and we're going to get through it. Um, there's just that that culture that is particularly prevalent in uh, in our church, but um, but also prevalent in society, that you can't show the weakness and, and uh, but I got news for you. Until you show the weakness, it's going to be hard to get better. That idea of being broken is critical. Seeds. There, uh, Kurt Bester has a song called "Broken," which is awesome, and I love the lyrics. And he talks about how you know you have to break bread in order to eat it, and you have to break ground in order to grow something in it. You just have to have broken stuff in order for it to work. Um, and uh, so we, you're on the right path. If you feel depressed, anxious, good for you. Keep going. You're on the right path. And you're in very, very good company. Yeah, and what a what an incredible reframe, right? I, I think you're right. You both have, have touched on it, you know, Gendelin and Dr. Morgan, that shame that's kind of there. And and sometimes I wonder if it's because as Latter-day Saints, we know we have the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we've got this plan of happiness. And there's these incredible scriptures. And I think that maybe, at least I could speak for myself. I know there's been times when I haven't wanted to show the struggle or show the depression or show the difficulty because maybe somehow I'm not uh, an adequate member of the church then, right? Because if I'm supposed to know what's right and I'm supposed to be sort of this beacon of light and hope and, and all of a sudden my light is dimmed, I don't want to show that to anybody because what if they doubt my testimony? And unfortunately we do as members of the church sometimes um, worry about things like that. Uh, everything from appearance to economic status to um, just overall worthiness or or our our idea of, of what worthiness is and if we're sort of matching those expectations. And I think that what is so powerful is uh, it doesn't matter because the Savior already suffered it so that we can go to him to get some help with it. And uh, what an amazing knowledge that is. Why would the Savior have suffered it if it wasn't supposed to be there for us? He suffered it in preparation for us to experience it and then be able to go to him for that relief. So his suffering was not in vain, my friends. He already suffered it for you. That's the part of the Savior's atonement that we often overlook. We we understand the part about the resurrection and that we can be redeemed from physical death. And we understand the part about him paying the price for our sins so that we can repent and be redeemed from spiritual death. But we don't look at that enabling part where he suffered all of our, our sorrows and our griefs and things like that. And it's like that example. I'm sorry, I stole your thunder about the guy in the hole. No, and, um, I, I, no I wasn't. I, I love the story, though. It's such I a great story. Your, 
right, but I've talked about it so much. I was like, oh, we're buzzing buddies. He likes my <laughs> same story. Yeah. Did you, did you get it on West Wing? I oh, I don't know. That's where it's, I heard it's been it. A part of my like I'm my, aware, my mind I'm for so aware. long. I'm I thought aware. I came up with it. Yeah. I thought, how did she hear about this? I thought that. <laughs> no, um, no, I think I did get it from West Wing. It's from Leo, right? When he yeah. talked about being yeah. an alcoholic. Yeah. I, I'm sure that's where I got it. But um, yeah, he has been through everything on our behalf. There's nothing that we can go through that he hasn't already experienced. And and I love that. I don't know if that this is pure doctrinal speculation, but I think was that a necessary part of his atonement? Or was that just something he said, you know, I want to really be able to understand them? Because he could have redeemed us from sin and death, maybe by just doing the other stuff. But he said, I want to know how it feels to be depressed. Because it's not a sin to be depressed, but it's miserable. It's not a sin to be anxious, but it's difficult. He says, I want to be able to understand them. And so I just, I mean, my my gratitude for the Savior is already overwhelming. When I think about that, I go, holy mackerel. I mean, who is this guy who is has done so much and was willing to do so much for us? And, and, and then no matter how much we run away from him, as soon as we come back, it's open arms. I mean, he's just, uh, he's the best. So true. Another question, and and maybe we'll, ha I know we're, we're going late, but my goodness, this is just so amazing, you guys. I mean, uh, I could, just, I feel like I could sit here and we could just, I could talk with you and listen to you and learn from you for at least like, are you guys good for the next five, six hours? I mean, you got anything going on? <laughs> I don't um, everyone else will tune out, but we'll, the three of us are probably <laughs> we're gonna have a good pass time, out yeah. about 30 minutes um, <laughs> from fever, but we can keep talking if you like. <laughs> oh, that's great. So the, the other question that I saw that um, I, I think is just a great one to address is, uh, is this. Um, my dad, is, this is uh, from Jamie. Uh, my dad asks every so often for help in understanding what myself and my sisters are dealing with through our mental health struggles. Do you have any tips on how to help one who seeks understanding? So, so, so she's saying is she doesn't know how to explain she it. She doesn't know how to explain it to her dad or, or that. Um, yeah. And I can, I can relate. Cause I, you know, as a man, sometimes I'm a fixer. Like I don't have sure. like the skills to fix anything in my house. I, I just have to hire people, but we, I have a desire to want to fix things. Right. And I know I want to do that for my kids or for my wife and, and, you know, if, if my kids are maybe struggling with something that I don't understand, but I want to understand, I would imagine that that's kind of what Jamie's dad is going through is maybe Jamie and her sisters or his sisters. I'm not sure, Jamie, sorry, um, are, are struggling with some mental health issues. And the dad saying, how do I how do I connect with you and understand this? And so maybe some tips for dad on how he could um, understand and, and connect. I think the best thing for him to do is simply to listen. Um, like you said, uh, there, there are many of us, a lot of us men that just want to fix things and it's no good. I mean, you have to just stop and listen and see what they have to say. Let them get it off their chest. Half the time that does the trick is just to say, you know what, dad, I feel a lot better just being able to talk about this. And, and a lot of these things we can't fix anyway, or, or at least you can't fix them in 20 minutes after dinner. You know, it's going to take months or years to fix uh, to fix it really well. Um, and I think and, and so then on, on the part of the helper, they also need to be patient as well, because what happens with particularly with parents is that their children's grief becomes their grief. And they think, you know, well, well, if you're depressed, then that makes me depressed. And I feel like I'm a bad parent because you're depressed. So we got to make you feel not depressed so that I can feel better about myself. And we can't be like that. You can't let that be, you can't let it be about you in that situation. So you have to take a very selfless approach in those moments and really just make it all about that other person and say, tell me what's going on. Is there, what, what can I do? And sometimes they don't want you to do anything. Sometimes it's, I just, I just want to be able to unload on you at the end of the day. Fantastic. I'd be happy to listen, um, that sort of thing. And, uh, and if they want to be fixed then say, sure, let's see what I can do to help but don't necessarily offer a tool, you know, immediately after they say there's a problem. I, I want to just add a couple of things because in all joking aside, I, I think there's a great toll on the mental health of a family when there's a member of the family that has chronic depression, and anxiety. And I also think there's a weariness factor. And one of the big lessons that I've shared publicly is that I couldn't save Meg. 
And she had a great therapist. She had a great bishop. She had good friends. She had family and support. And, and a few months before she passed, my mom really had come to the peace of she had done everything. And I think that probably saved my mom's life after Meg died. That's the first thing I want to say is that everyone on the planet either struggles or loves someone that struggles or like our family has already lost someone. That's literally everyone on the entire planet. So I agree with David that we could get a huge Zoom call and we would all admit at some level we have a mental health issue, all of us. I think the, the other thing I would say is because sometimes I'm the one who has the anxiety and it can lead to depression for me. Um, I tend to want to isolate because I don't want to get it on anyone. And that may, may sound crazy, but my friends that struggle as well totally get what I'm saying. My husband, on the other hand, it's not that he hasn't had bouts of depression or anxiety, but he doesn't struggle with it. It's not a chronic thing. He doesn't wake up every morning knowing he's going to have to battle this this thorn, as Paul said. And so one of the things is he too, Kevin, wants to fix. I mean, he's wired that way. And validation and pushing him out and then he seems fine and I'm pretty self-reliant. I know my toolbox. I know what I need to do to take care of myself. But lately, the things that have worked aren't working. You know, really my toolbox, I've gone through all my tools and I keep using them, but I've been pushed to having to really fall to my knees and, and to be vulnerable with him and say, this is how it feels is scary because I'm like, I want to talk myself out of it. So I would say to the person, the friend that asked this question is that they, they have a right to try to describe it the best they can. And they can say, I'm going to try to describe to you the way it feels to me. I think one of the really helpful ways to describe it is I'm afraid what I'm feeling is going to get on the people I love. And so that's why I isolate. There's a shame factor to it as well. I'm a very you know, proactive checklist kind of person. That's how come I get the things done. I do. So there's a part of me that's like, why can't I take care of this? You know? And what I've learned is it's not blessing my husband to not also have the stewardship assignment of being married to me. And, and he deals with some other things that affect my life. And that's what interdependence in a family looks like. But what, what David was just saying is there's a codependent that can easily creep in. And, and it's an exhausting thing. I've taken many phone calls over the years with families that have one member of the family on the edge. You know, they've, they've either run away and gone homeless. They've tried to kill themselves multiple times. They've been in and out of treatment centers, whatever it is. And the first thing I say to the family is this isn't your fight. You know, you can love and you can inspire, but that's about all you can do. And so you have my permission to say this is my boundary. I'm exhausted. And the real fact is there's a risk every day. If you love someone that is suicidal, that that could be the day, you know, the day Meg was found by my brother was the fulfillment of my biggest fear. And so when people say, do you deal with some PTSD? Well, yeah, the thing I spent my whole life, she was born in Germany, by the way, Kevin, I lived in, I lived in Nuremberg and it was the first language I learned to speak. And, um, I had always taken care of her. And so in my mind, I hadn't saved her. You know, so I would say, tell your family, thank you for checking in. I don't have the words to say, and I promise you, I will ask for what I need help with. And then the person listening needs to say, what does help look like for you today? That's the greatest question to ask anyone, whether they have mental health issues or not. Whether we're trying to minister, whether we're trying to be a teacher, whether we're trying to be a parent or a spouse, what does support look like for you today? Because for you, it may be different, Kevin, than it looks like for me, right? And so sometimes the support I need for my husband is he needs to just sit there, like just sit in the room. I can't look at him. I can't talk about what I'm feeling. I just need to know he's sitting there. And that might seem like a silly thing. Or like last night, I just wanted to watch a movie. I didn't want to talk about work. I didn't want to talk about the issues. I just wanted to eat some popcorn and watch a movie. I had processed to the nth degree. I had nothing left in me. So just say, you know, what would be great is for you to say to me today, I don't know, but tomorrow say, what does support look like today? What's one thing I can do to support you? Not save you, not fix you, but support. It's great. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. You know, um, I'll just chime in just briefly about one of the things that I, I'm trying to learn 
Um, I, and and then we'll have Gainalyn give us a closing prayer and we'll conclude. But um, Jamie, for your dad. Uh, so because I'm a dad, because I have this tendency to want to be a fixer, I, I, I started to wonder where that comes from. And um, I am an incredibly prideful man. Um, and it is something I struggle with. It is something I am seeking to overcome. But that pride sometimes makes me feel like I have the ability to fix. And uh, my wife and our kids, uh, we did this thing a while ago. It was like a thing at Orem High School and it was like this family course. And we just wanted additional tools as we were raising our kids. And it was really good. We'd go like every week, they'd feed us dinner. The parents would go to one session, the kids would go to another, and then we'd all come back and kind of talk together. And it was this really cool program. And, and I'd heard something there that maybe everybody has heard of, but I hadn't. And it's something that has stuck with me ever since. And it's this little thing called love listening, right? L-U-B, which is to listen, understand, and validate. And I know your dad, uh, Jamie, is, is trying to understand. Well, um, sometimes what I've come to realize for my wife or even for my kids is I may not be able to understand, but I definitely can validate. And I think that's some of what Gaina Lynn said too, is, um, and even the, even the, the word, not that you want to, not that he would want to lie and tell you he understands, but I think that like with my kids or my wife, I can, under, I may not understand the root of what's going on, but I can understand that they're in it. I, and I can be okay with the fact that they're in it. And, and I can listen and, and just shut up because I, I, I Gina Lynn said something earlier about, you know, she can't be a therapist because she would maybe, you know, talk them to death. That's my problem too. I just don't shut up. And so if I could just zip my lid and listen, and then at least if I can't understand what they're in, if I can at least understand that they're in it and then validate the fact that they're there, sometimes it's enough to say, listen, I, 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 I hear you. I understand you're feeling some kind of way. And you know what? It's okay. And then you add Daniel Lynn's advice. What's that one thing I could do for you or what would support look like or what would help look like? And so that love listening, it's given me a chance to press pause on my pride and just shut up and realize that I can't fix it all, that I'm not a fixer. Um, I, the song from Frozen, he's a bit of a fixer upper. It's just running through my head like I can't. It's just, that's all I got. Um, but, <laughs> but I have to understand that I can't always fix, but I always can listen. I can tr uh, seek to understand, even if it's just understanding that they're in it. And then I can validate the fact that they're there. And those things, that love that I can give through that type of love, L-U-B, listening, um, I found is sometimes enough just to just to help in that moment it looks like jamie said that's exactly what she was looking for so and i would also say jamie one of the things just to add is that there's a difference we need to have another fireside about this i hope onwards listening sympathy versus empathy and sympathy makes me feel creepy so sometimes be careful when when you're struggling and someone says i understand how you feel and and you want to poke their eyeballs out because you're like so like, for example, my friends of color right now, I've had a lot of conversations with them about the race issues. And I say to them, listen, I'm obviously not a black woman, even though secretly God knows that's what I pray for every night. I wish I was. I was raised in an all black neighborhood. And my mom was a divorced mom with two little girls. We were the only white family other than the gay couple across the street. All my friends were black. And so I was very socialized from a very young age to define beauty. And it didn't look like anything you're seeing on the computer screen right now. Like for me, what is beautiful was not this, right? And so that's in all seriousness, my friends of color, I've said to them, I can only empathize from a place. Sympathy is like, you're over on that side of the fence. Oh, poor you. That's how I've tried to describe to my spouse specifically. Because he used to always do that. Oh, I'm so sorry. That must be hard. I know exactly how you feel. And, and empathy is saying, and I'm willing to come back and talk about this because I think it's a, a, it's a skill that we can all develop to save us through the last days. 
because I'm more concerned with the ites and the divisions that are manifesting. You wear masks, you don't wear masks. You believe in Black Lives Matter, you don't believe in Black Lives Matter. Like there's so much division. You're a de Democrat, you're a Republican. Everyone's mad. And so whether it's mental health or not, empathy is saying, I haven't had that, but I can validate Kevin because I'm a fixer too. It makes me scared at, at times when I can't help my kids and they're struggling. My friends of color, I've said, I don't know how to empathize with that. But as a woman, I've gone into a room and I've already had everyone decide who they think I am based on how I look and that I'm a woman. That, oh, I just must be one of those typical Mormon moms who's never had anything in her life and lives in Utah, right? And so I'll say to my friends of color, I don't know what it's like to have a colored bias, but I have felt bias in other ways. So help me understand your experience. And I think my kids constantly are saying, no shocker here, mom. I, and I'll say to them, mom, do you want the mom that gives advice or do you want the mom that just listens? And most of the time, nine out of 10, they just want the listening mom. And then I have to like sit on my hands because I like to talk with my hands. And then I chew gum. And I go, hmm, 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 hmm. So that's my other tip. That empathy can come from, you might not know what chronic illness feels like, but you know what the flu feels like. So go to that place in your heart and say, oh my gosh, if I had the flu the rest of my life, that's, that, is that a little bit what you're feeling? You know? And just ask, you know? So that we, and I'm not good at this when it's the people I gave birth to or I'm sealed to. Everyone else I'm great at it with. Welcome to my world. <laughs> people, people often ask and they say, so do you like, do you like psychoanalyze like your brothers and sisters or your spouse? And I say, are you kidding? If I'm not getting paid, I'm not working. I'm, not, you know. I'm going to Disneyland. Yeah, if I can build the insurance, then sure, let's great. talk. You know, That's I don't work great. for free. No, That's but you're awesome. such great points, Gendalyn. And you're right. We've all been through something that can help us understand what someone else is going through. Not exactly the same thing, but a corollary to it. And, and we, and we, we may not be able to understand it at the, at the extreme level, they may be experiencing it, but we can to a certain level. And so I think we all have, I think that's why we go through stuff is uh, so that not only so that we can go through it, but then we become kind of lowercase s saviors for other people. So that when they, you know, 10 years down the road, once you've mastered your anxiety issues and then you get this person that comes to you and says, hey, I, I've got anxiety. You say, hey, I've been there. Let me show you what I did. Let me help you, you know, and, and I know what that's like because going through it is a, such a greater teacher as evidenced by the Savior's atonement, right? He didn't read a book about it in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went through it on our behalf. And that's kind of what we do as well. And it makes us um, more like him. Well, you two, thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who stuck with us. Thank you to everybody that's tuning in at a later time and a later date. Um, the good thing about doing virtual firesides is this information and what Gaynell Lynn and Dr. Morgan shared can live on in the interwebs forever <laughs> and ever. And what a blessing that is. Um, Sometimes I don't want to think about how much of me is out there. Yeah, no, no, no kidding. It's kind of like, I have a friend who plays the trumpet and I'm like, does anyone remember your first recital? I said, I didn't think so, but everyone can read my first book. That yeah. wasn't as good as my last one, you know, and everyone can, can look at my first presentation. They're like, Whoa, what the heck? You know? So yeah. things that come up out there, you have to take a little bit of humble, humble pie and say, okay, that was my first. That's, time, guys. That's, so, that's that's on I, say, I know who my boss is. I showed up on the field. He's going to have to use grace to cover my mistakes so that I can show up tomorrow and do it again. That's, that's yes. so true. Well, okay, I'm doing the closing prayer, right? Yes. Yeah, you are. You guys have been incredible. Thank you to everybody. And let me just, before Gaynell Lynn closes, let me just say, brothers and sisters, you were here for a reason tonight. I want you to take what you learned and apply it. I promise you and bear you my testimony that your savior knows, he understands, he is available right now. He never closes and what he can do for you and how he can bless your life and your soul. Um, there will never be a limit to it. So don't feel bad to pull from it because it is available in ample 
and infinite amounts. And I leave that with you in my testimony of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our dear, kind Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the technology that has helped us gather together virtually tonight. We're grateful for the things that we've learned, for the promptings we've received, for the comfort of the Spirit, for the strength that we've had to deliver these messages, and for the open hearts that have received them. Heavenly Father, Thou knowest the prayers of each of the individual participants tonight. Thou knowest the struggles of those that will view this video later. You are aware of what we are dealing with as a global family during this year of 2020. And we ask and plead with thee, Heavenly Father, that we will become a Zion people ready to welcome the Savior again. Help us to be more united, one heart and one mind. Strengthen us in our faith and in our health and in our courage. Help us to find ways to uplift one another and help us to have protection in our homes and around our homes, especially as the temples are not available to us at this time. And Heavenly Father, please be with the missionaries serving at this time, especially that they will be comforted, that they will be strengthened, that they will be blessed for their sacrifice and their pivoting and doing their missions in a different way than they had planned. And Heavenly Father, please bless this Onward Productions team that their, their productions and their events will continue to spread and that this Onward Production family will continue to grow and that, that we will be able to uplift and strengthen one another until the Savior comes again. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, everybody. Gaina Lynn, Dr. Morgan, thank you. And Onward Productions, thank you, thank you, thank you for giving this platform to the world. You are amazing. Shane and Mandy, we love you to pieces. The work you do and the good that you are can never be adequately expressed. So thank you, everybody. Should we dance now, out? Should we dance out? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is that... David doesn't Morgan, know where you yeah. This is my first fireside. I didn't know you have to dance. Oh, oh, no. I'm when talking to Shane and Mandy about this. This was not in the uh, instruction. In the description. <laughs> yeah, I'm the only okay. one with no Diet Coke in my system right now. So this is the issue. <laughs> with Kevin Host. Do we this is it? caffeinated, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Have a Thank wonderful you. night. Bye-bye. Well, there you go. We're not done. No we're way. Not. We're having too much fun. Keep going. And uh, we're still just gonna live. Hang out. Mm -hmm. So now we're gonna. Now we're gonna. Um, now we're gonna all uh, perform our favorite song. Uh, Gina Lynn sounds like she's gonna be performing Christmas music. Okay, Dr. Morgan. I thought she was doing the Bangles. Walk like an Egyptian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> David, I think we're close to the same age because we're watching the same stuff. We're repeating yep. the same stories. We're listening to the same music. What year were you born? 71. 69. Okay. That's so right. my husband was born 68. So we're in the same vicinity. So you're my younger sister's age. Wow. Who was always left in charge when, when my parents went out. because <laughs> They knew I wasn't responsible. And when they put Annie in charge... She's probably watching this now, Annie, and she she knows she was it was right. Uh, as a fourteen year old, I wasn't too happy about it. Okay, we're leaving for a few hours. Annie's in charge. I'm like, Annie's in charge. Come on. My daughter is six years younger than my son, and I still he's twenty two. Return missionary. I'd still put her in charge over him. <laughs> hey, Gatalin, I got to tell you what my wife just said. She just said, Gatalin, I challenge you and Kev to do the whole fireside without using your hands. That would be oh. impossible for me. I have, when I can't use my hands, my mouth doesn't work. It's, really? it's I don't, you think I'm an Italiano, but I'm not, oh. I just can't, I don't know. Listen, we're still recording this live, but I'm gonna say the fun fact. I host, I host three shows. One is Real Talk Come Follow Me, one is Women of Worth Wednesday on the High Five Live page. And the other one is a brand new show called The Middle and it's non-denominational. And my camera guy, no one will ever see him except I want him as a guest. And he has a handlebar mustache. Okay? It's beautiful. His name's Jake. But he does this thing, like the middle is, I have this beautiful set, this big yellow couch. I've had Alex Boyer. We're having the Mahis on. It's amazing. 
but he has to count for five seconds where we cannot make a sound and we can't move. So, so that's horrible for me. Right. So I'm trying to get all pumped up and help my guests feel comfortable. And he's sitting over there and he'll tease me because he'll go really slow. Like one, <laughs> two, three. But one day he did this to, to give me a signal. He went like this and twisted it. And then I'm like energized again. So now <laughs> he has to twist his mustache every single time. That'll do it. Yeah. I don't know if Mandy and Shane are ever going to turn off the production. Oh, no. Nope. I just mm -hmm. I just texted Shane and said, "Hey, we're we're kind of done over here. May, is it like a meter and you put like a oh, quarter no. in it?" He just and texted it keeps going his, until it said his computer froze. I think it crashed at the end of the closing prayer. In like a lion, out like a lion, or in like a lamb, out like a lion. So mm -hmm. I don't know if he's trying to reboot, 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 reboot. Yeah. Well, either way. Um, we, uh, I'll tell you what, it is, it, anybody that goes to this part of the production deserves like a bonus. You know what I mean? Like, I don't 